Hey everyone, welcome to uh, today's uh, NLP conference uh, live at Manning. So thanks for tuning in. I'll be covering some, an interesting topic, deep transfer learning for natural language processing. And we'll be covering some interesting concepts as well as go through some hands-on tutorials. Uh, and the intent of this session is to kind of journey through some of the recent advancements in deep transfer learning for NLP. And we will take a look at various state-of-the-art models, which will include leveraging pre-trained embeddings, looking at universal embeddings, and then also talk about uh, one of the most popular models, which has been released, I think, a couple of years back, transformers. And We'll also look at how we can solve various problems, including an interesting problem of how do you do text classification when you have uh, less data, and also look at uh, solving a wide variety of problems like summarization, question answering, and so on. So slides and code will be available. It's open source, by the way, so you don't need to like take down notes or go through each and everything right now. Just try to get the main essence of what I'll be talking about. And you can access all the code, uh, the material, which will be presented today in today's session at this link. So it's basically uh, bit.ly slash lmnop underscore ds20. I'll pause here for a moment before we head into the presentation. Okay, so a bit about myself. I'm a data science lead at Applied Materials. I'm also an author. I've published several books on machine learning, uh, deep learning, transfer learning, and NLP. I'm also working on a new initiative with Manning Publications, and uh, I'm also a mentor at Springboard and a Google developer expert in machine learning. So today's agenda, we'll start off with a brief about transfer learning for the folks who may not have uh, much idea around what is transfer learning. Then we'll talk about deep transfer learning in the context of uh, natural language processing. And then we'll cover various uh, modeling approaches with regard to uh, model architectures and methodologies of applying deep transfer learning for NLP. And finally, we'll wrap up the session with some hands-on tutorials. So a brief about transfer learning. Uh, I think a lot of you might be aware about it, but the whole concept of transfer learning is the ability to kind of utilize knowledge learned in prior tasks into new and novel tasks. So the whole perspective around this is, let's say you know how to ride a motorbike, it'll be easier for you to know how to ride a car or learn how to ride a car by leveraging some of that uh, pre-learned knowledge when you learned how to ride a motorbike. Same with, let's say, if you want to learn machine learning, if you have a solid foundation on math and st statistics, you'll be able to uh, learn machine learning much better and much faster. And the whole aspect of traditional machine learning versus transfer learning is that uh, traditional machine learning happens in silos where every task which needs to be solved, it has a data set and you will basically build models from scratch on this data set and try to solve, let's say, task one. But when you have a new task to solve, let's say, task two, again, you will be building a model from scratch on data set two, which is the new data set to solve that problem. Uh, learning is not shared across tasks, but in transfer learning, that is exactly what happens where if you build a model on a data set and solve a specific task, you can use some of that knowledge, use some of that prior knowledge into solving a new problem where you have a new task and some new data on which you need to build a model. So you don't always train models from scratch in case of transfer learning. And with regard to transfer learning scenarios for NLP, this is a nice depiction which talks about uh, when you are doing transfer learning, whether you are trying to solve the same task. So if you have already built a model and now you're trying to build another model in context of a different task, but the type of task could be same, like let's say language translation or classification. So that falls under transductive transfer learning. And when you are having different tasks, like let's say you have done classification, but now you may need to do clustering, that may go under in inductive transfer learning. And then there are further subcategories to this, like when your uh, feature distribution itself is different across the data sets and tasks, that becomes domain adaptation. When you are dealing with different languages, that becomes cross-lingual learning. Uh, multitask learning is an interesting concept which has been applied in models like universal embeddings as well as transformers where you train a model on different tasks so that it is able to be more generic and the representations it learns can be generalizable across a wide variety of tasks. And tasks learned sequentially falls under sequential transfer learning where uh, deep transfer learning for NLP has seen the most success in recent times. 
So coming to deep transfer learning for NLP, the typical workflow for this is uh, with regard to sequential transfer learning for NLP, which has led to the biggest improvement so far in the field of natural language processing, uh, particularly in the last, uh, you can say, couple of years, right? So the idea here is you don't train models in silos, but you build first what is called as a uh, language model. So this is the pre-training phase where I ingest large uh, text corpora or a single corpus also maybe. And that is where we take in data, let's say from Wikipedia, we take in data from the web, uh, common crawl, uh, books, uh, so on and so forth. And we take in this huge uh, corpus and we build a language model where the typical task is given a sequence of words, what is going to be the next word. So that is known as a language modeling task. And of course there are variants of it as we will see during transformers, which has mask language modeling, next sentence prediction and so on. But the whole idea here is to ingest this corpus and try to understand the relationship between the words and build some kind of a generic uh, representation learning scenario with regard to the data which it is seen. So what happens is once the model has learned these representations, then you can take in this model with all the pre-trained weights and all the layers, and then you can adapt this to your own task. So that is known as the adaptation phase, which is what typically we in the industry focus on, where we will take in one of these pre-trained models and try to use it for our own task or adapt it to our own task, which could be classification, sequence labeling, question answering, summarization, and so on. So for pre-training, what happens is there are various types of uh, models, like uh, one is word or context-based representations where we have, or we started with word embeddings like word to tech, glove, fast text. We journeyed into uh, context-based embeddings like Elmo. And then there are simple language models also like RNNs, LSTMs, bidirectional LSTMs, GRUs. And then we have these newer models, which are called the generalized language modeling family of models like ULM fit, uh, GPT bird, uh, GPT and bird basically fall under the transformers uh, family. And the adaptation phase, uh, it could be done in two ways, typically just like you do in transfer learning. One is you keep the model architecture and the weights unchanged, you use it as it is. Maybe you can uh, train some downstream dense layers and your final output layer, but you use it more as a feature extractor. Uh, uh, the other one is where you can fine tune the model architecture itself by removing some layers or freezing or fine tuning layers. Like let's say you want to freeze the batch normalization layers or you want to freeze the layers towards the uh, upper side of the network and the deeper layers you unfreeze. And basically you fine tune the model weights so that you can adapt that model's knowledge towards your own data. So let's talk about the various modeling approaches which are out there. Um, uh, these are the uh, model architectures we'll be discussing today. Of course, this is not like an exhaustive list of models. There are a whole lot of models out there. Like we, we are not covering ULM fit here, but that's also an interesting uh, methodology. So for the models here, as you can see, one approach could be you take in uh, pre-trained uh, embeddings, uh, like uh, let's say Google has trained uh, embeddings on a huge corpus of data uh, using word to vec uh, Facebook has trained fast text embeddings. So you can take in those embeddings and you plug it into a downstream deep learning model based on the task you're trying to solve. Here we look at a classification task. So we look at how you can plug in CNNs, which is convolution neural networks with embeddings, how you can plug in uh, bidirectional, LSTMs, which is of the recurrent neural network family of models, along with an attention mechanism. We will also look at universal embeddings like neural network language model and universal sentence encoders, which can take in uh, text of variable length and generate a fixed sized embedding. And by the way, an embedding is just a term for a fixed sized vector where the vector will have a a uh, fixed size dimension, like let's say a size 300. So it will basically have a bunch of numbers. That is how you represent a, a word or a concept uh, in terms of math, because as you know, machine learning or deep learning models, they can't really understand uh, text directly or natively. You need to translate it into a numeric representation. That is where embeddings uh, become really handy. And the last one is transformers, which focus more on contextual embeddings and representation. So we'll look at word, distal word briefly uh, before we go into the tutorials. So diving into each of these uh, subsections, so pre-trained embeddings uh, plus deep learning models. 
like I said, the context of an embedding layer is basically where you represent embeddings for each and every word in your vocabulary. So let's say we have the sequence of text uh, from a movie review. Movie was good. What happens is every word or every unique word has a positional mapping or a positional index, as you can see, like movie is mapped to position index two, was to 57 and so on. And let's say here we have around 82,000 odd unique words in our corpus of movie reviews. So basically what that means is this is our vocabulary set. So what happens is typically we map these words into its positional indices and these positional indices basically help us map to the exact embedding representation in our embedding layer. So as you can see here in this embedding layer, which is actually transposed. So the rows here represent the embedding dimension, which is of size 128. I mean, standard sizes could be 128, uh, even 300, because most embedding, uh, pre-trained embedding models are available as dimensions 300. So this bunch of numbers represent the embedding uh, for a word in position zero. So basically the movie is in position two, which means uh, zero, one, two. This embedding is basically the representation for the word movie. And you can see that gets extracted out here. So similarly, what happens is the embedding layer is like a dictionary lookup, which uh, contains the embedding representation of every word. And as you ingest in a sequence of words, you will extract out the right embedding representation from that layer. And then you will pass it to the downstream deep learning layers like convolutions, uh, sequences, uh, and so on, depending on the type of model you're using. And the whole aspect here is typically, as you know, any kind of a neural network model or a neural network layer uh, is usually initialized with some random weights. Well, it's not exactly random, but there are different mathematical functions which we can use like Xavier initialization, uniform in initialization and so on. But those numbers are still random in the form of a distribution. But the whole context here is instead of initializing the embedding layer with random weights, which you can do by the way, uh, the idea is can we pre populate this with embeddings from already a pre-trained model, which is out there. And that is where, like I said, Facebook has fast text, Google has Vertivec and Glove. Can we take in these embedding representations where the model has already seen a lot of text so it knows uh, better contextual representations of words, like which words are closer to which words and so on. So that the hope here is if we initialize it with these pre-trained embeddings, maybe the model may perform better than just a random initialization leading to faster convergence and better performance. By the way, this is not always guaranteed. This is not like a silver bullet, but in many cases it does perform well, assuming let's say your domains are kind of similar to what you're training versus what you are using from the pre-trained perspective. And with regard to fast text, I'll briefly cover this. So fast text basically has a similar training architecture as word to vec as you know, where uh, in word to vec every word has an embedding representation and it follows typically uh, one of these two uh, shallow neural network architectures, where in continuous bag of words, we try to predict the center word uh, based on the surrounding words of the context. And in skip gram, we try to predict the context of the surrounding words given the center word or the target word. So the idea of fast text is very similar, but it is uh, also built on top of subword information where it considers every word as a bag of character engrams, which means let's say the word where is there. The embedding for the word where is not just built from one embedding as in word to fair, but it is built of an average embedding representation from subwords in where, as you can see where it has these uh, three character engram, uh, character engram tokens, like starting token WH, WH, EHER, and so on. So all the embedding representations of these subwords are averaged together to form where, and that is where fast text sometimes performs better than word to fact in especially representing rare words and out of vocabulary terms. Coming to the downstream models, I'm pretty sure all of you are aware about convolution neural networks. The whole perspective here is once you have a sequence of text, imagine that is like a one dimensional image, you can slide a kernel or a convolution filter across that sequence of text. And then you can have some downstream pooling layers also to prevent overfitting and faster training times. And then you build intermediate representations. And finally, you try to predict your downstream uh, task, like let's say classification, which we'll be doing in our case. Uh, the other model which we'll be covering is uh, bidirectional LSTMs and attention. So the whole idea here is, again, you have an input layer where x1, x2, x3 are your words in sequence. 
Uh, you will get the right embeddings from that embedding layer lookup table as we discussed, and then you will pass it through some bidirectional GRUs or LSTMs, where GRU is a data recurrent unit or LSTM is long short term memory. So these have memory units and are much better than the vanilla recurrent neural network model. And then what you do is, uh, there are two ways to go next. One is you take the last hidden state from the last LSTM cell and you pass it to the fully connected layers and make your predictions. Or you can take all the hidden states and take a weighted average of that. And that weighted average is uh, computed using another shallow neural network representation that is called the tension layer. So in that way, you can take perspectives from all the hidden states instead of compressing the full sequential information only from the last hidden state. So brief about LSTM, I'm sure most of you are aware about it, but just uh, for the sake of completeness, LSTMs typically can remember much longer sequences of data than RNNs. It has three inputs as you can see here. So XT is the input at the current time step because you can even use these models for temporal data like time series forecasting. In our case, XT is the word at the current uh, position, right, uh, in a sentence. And then HT minus one output from the previous LSTM unit and CT minus one is the memory of the cell state also from the previous unit. So these are the key parameters which are shared as we go through each and every LSTM cell when the sequence of words gets passed in. And uh, the three gates which are of focus here is the forget gate, which decides what is relevant to retain from the previous steps. The input gate decides what uh, information can be added in from the current step, new information can be added in. And the output gate decides what the next uh, hidden state should be. So that is the overall architecture of an LSTM cell. And now what happens is, uh, why are we talking about bi-directional LSTM? So, the whole, concept, uh, the whole concept here is that when you have a sequence of words, uh, some of the words mentioned later on in the sequence can change the contextual meaning of some of the words which are occurring previously. Like as you can see here, here Teddy basically means a toy in the first sentence, but in the second sentence, because we mentioned Roosevelt was a great president, president means that Teddy is basically not a toy here, but a person. So words occurring later in the sequence can change the contextual representation or meaning previously and basically help it encode more information. So how do we encode this information in a computer, right? They are not as intelligent as us where our brain has a full worldview concept of so many things happening around us. So that is where we use bidirectional LSTMs. And this is nothing complex. As you can see in this diagram, it is just putting two independent LSTMs together, which occur uh, sequence by sequence and process the word. So what happens is, uh, the words in a sentence are passed from the front to the back in forward order for one LSTM, as you can see in these purple LSTM cells. And it is passed in the reverse order from back to front in the other LSTM network. And the outputs from each of these LSTM cells in these two networks are usually concatenated at each step to get the final hidden states. And this concatenation, you can just concatenate, you can take an average, again, multiple ways of doing this, just like you have max pooling, average pooling, some pooling, and so on. Now, the idea, like I said, why we are doing this is to preserve information from both the past and the future to help understand the context and the contextual representations better. That's the whole reason for using a bidirectional LSTM. And about attention. So the idea is uh, what usually happens is we take this last hidden state and we pass it to a fully connected layer. But the idea is instead of doing that, because the longer your sequences become, it becomes more hard to encode all information from the full sequence into just the last hidden state. So why not take all the hidden states together and try to find out which of these states are most influential in predicting either your output sequence, if you consider a sequence to sequence model, or let's say our output, uh, the final outcome, right? Like whether it is, uh, uh, class A, class B, and so on, if you're doing classification. So that is where instead of using the output from the last LSTM cell, you send the entire sequence to a global attention layer. And this is basically the attention layer. So what happens is the vectors from the hidden sequence. Uh, so as you can see here, H1 is a hidden state from the first word in the sequence, H2 from the next and so on. So you pass in all these hidden states uh, into the learnable function. So A of HT, so A of HT is the learnable function, which is basically a artificial neural network, 
put some nonlinearity coded into it. And what happens is this helps in producing a weighted probability vector. So what happens is it gives weights to each of these hidden states based on which of these hidden states are most influential in predicting the outcome as it learns that based on multiple epochs across the back propagation and the gradient updates. And then what happens is you can take this final uh, weighted vector and you can do a basically an uh, summation, right? A weighted sum or a weighted average, and you get the final context vector. So instead of your context vector being the last hidden state, take a weighted um, average or a weighted sum of this. That is the whole concept of attention. And you can summarize what I just said in these three mathematical equations, where as I discussed before, uh, A of HT is where you're passing it through an artificial neural network and you're encoding with some non-linearity as you can see. Too. So WX plus B where X is each of the hidden states, uh, right? You encode that with a tannish non-linearity and then you do a soft max. The reason for that is just to normalize the weights so that they sum up to one and then your context vector, as you can see, is basically the weighted sum of your alpha vector and each of the hidden states. And this context vector is a flat vector. You can then pass it to your fully connected layers, your output layer, and so on. So let's talk briefly about universal embeddings. So the whole perspective of universal embeddings, as you can see, is uh, you have a variable length document and it will always give you a fixed length vector. There are two interesting models here, uh, neural network language model. There's an interesting paper by Bengio. So I've uh, linked the research papers also in my GitHub. I will share that link at the end. So feel free to read the research paper also to really understand how this works. It's a pretty interesting model. The whole idea here is that this pre-trained model, which is available for us on TensorFlow Hub, which we will use in a tutorial, uh, this is basically a three hidden layer neural network that is again, as I said, trained on that next word prediction task. So given a sequence of words, what is the next word? And here the embedding layer during the pre-training phase is shared across all the words. So that is how the neural network language model works. And the next type of uh, universal embedding model is the universal sentence encoder model. So what happens here is, as you can see, again, you can take a variable length uh, vector, uh, variable, sorry, variable length uh, sequence of uh, text, and it will always encode it to a fixed length sequence so in the NNLM model, it will encode it to a 128 sized fixed vector in case of universal sentence encoder, it is slightly high dimensional which where it will encode it into a size of 512 sized vector. So as mentioned here, USC encodes text of any kind of a length into a fixed sized vector of size 512. And then you can use those vectors for multiple downstream tasks like uh, similarity analysis recommendations, clustering, question answering, uh, classification, and so on. And how is this pre-training phase happening, right? Like for us, I mean, we don't really care much about it because we use the pre-trained model in our downstream tasks, but it's interesting to know that how does Google, let's say, build this model. So there are two architectural variants or two ways in which you can build a universal sentence encoder from scratch during the pre-training phase. One is by leveraging the encoder, subgraph, and transformers. As you know, there are encoders and decoders. And the other one is you can use deep averaging networks. And there is a nice paper also on universal sentence encoder where this is mentioned in slightly more detail. But the gist of this is that if you want to use the transformer subgraph, what happens is you use the encoder stack because as we'll talk about shortly, and there's a session upcoming also on transformers, a transformer model is a stacked encoder decoder model. But usually we will use either the encoder or the decoder block in most cases. So in this case, we use only the encoder stack from the transformer model. And why we use this, this is used so that they use concepts like self-attention and multi-headed attention, which we will cover in brief today. And the reason for using this is to compute this context-aware representation of words in sentence, where it takes into account both the ordering, the identity, and the relationship amongst the words. And then what happens is these context-aware word representations are con uh, converted into a fixed length sentence encoding vector. So what happens is every word has a contextual embedding vector. And then you take the element by sum of all these words and you get that fixed length document vector. So the element wise sum helps you in getting the final document vector. You don't get it like directly first. Every word has its, context, has its contextual embedding, just like Elmo and so on. And then you 
compute the element-wise sum across the embeddings of all these words in sequence to get the document embedding. And typically it takes as an input a pen-free bank tokenized string and outputs the 512 dimensional vector. For deep averaging networks, uh, what typically happens is uh, the input embeddings uh, here are not just words, but we consider both words and bigrams. And as you know, bigram is basically two words which are occurring consecutively in a sequence of words. So every two words occurring in the sequence, those words are also taken as uh, to build these embedding representations. So what happens is if we have a sentence, we take the word embeddings, we take the bigram embeddings, we average them together, we pass them to a feed forward neural network uh, to produce a final sentence embedding of size 128, sorry, 512, because this is the uh, universal sentence encoder. Uh, in case of uh, NNLM, it would be of size 128. Uh, the training methodology here, like I said, uh, this model uses multitask learning so that you can learn generic representations to feed in multiple downstream tasks. Uh, it uses both unsupervised learning, which is the next word prediction, along with also training on supervised learning uh, based data from the Stanford Natural Language Inference Corpus, where the whole idea is to predict entailment that given we have some sentence, what is the kind of entailment which is happening uh, with regard to uh, various categories there. So that is where it trains on both supervised as well as unsupervised tasks to build more generic representations. Uh, a brief about transformers now. So transformers, as we discussed, is basically a layered and stacked encoder decoder model. And it relies on uh, various attention uh, methodologies, uh, not just only one attention block as we saw earlier with global attention, but it works on the principles of self-attention and multi-headed attention during the encoder uh, stack. And it also uses self-attention, multi-headed attention, along with an encoder-decoder attention block. And the best part about transformers is that it is completely parallelized. There is no sequential training. So the, the inspiration of transformers came from a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, where you typically input a sequence of words, and you get as an output another sequence of words, also known as an encoder-decoder model. Now, in those models, typically you have to enter the sentence uh, word by word in sequence. Uh, and the training time obviously is longer and it becomes difficult to remember these longer sequences also over time. That is where transformers uh, motivate the fact that it tries to solve those problems where the input sequence you can pass in one shot. You don't need to pass it word by word, but it does encode the sequential aspects using some time-based embedding concepts. But the main thing is the training is completely parallelized. You don't pass in word by word. And as most of you already know, it has achieved state of the art performance on uh, several NLP tasks. Uh, diving a bit deeper into this, at heart, a transformer model, like I said, is a stacked encoder decoder model. It has several stacked encoder and decoder blocks uh, based on standard architectures. Like if you're talking about the bird base model, it has a 12 layered encoder decoder, sorry, 12 layered encoder stack from the transformer model. And if you're using BERT large, it will be like 24 encoder layers uh, stacked one on top of the other. And like I was saying, based on the type of the transformer model, only the encoder part or the decoder part could be used. And in many cases like T5 and BART, uh, you use uh, both the encoder and the decoder blocks. A brief about, uh, uh, slightly a detailed view of this model, though you will learn more in the Transformers um, talk, which is upcoming today. But uh, in the encoder part, like I said, you have uh, self-attention and the feed forward layers. And the whole concept of self-attention is every word attends to every other word. So it tries to understand the representation of each word in the context of other words in the sentence. So that is the whole aspect of self-attention. And the output of the self-attention layer is fed to a feed-forward neural network. Something to remember here is that there is not just one self-attention layer, but like multiple self-attention uh, layers, just like a CNN where you have multiple on filters. Here you have multiple self-attention layers that becomes your multi-headed attention. So every self-attention layer is like an attention head and there are multiple layers which try to encode different aspects about the same sequence of words, which we will talk about shortly. And the decoder has similar layers, but between them as an encoder decoder attention layer to help the decoder focus on relevant parts of the input sentence, which is most influential in predicting the outcome. 
So self-attention, a simplistic overview. So given the time I have, I have around half an hour. So uh, self-attention is basically where every word attends to all the other words and try to figure out which words are influencing the representation of which words. So as you can see here, the bat was sleeping. So if I look at this sentence, uh, the word bat in general can mean multiple things like a baseball bat or a cricket bat or the animal bat itself. Now, when we go through the sentence, think about it like how does our brain function? As soon as we read the sentence, we figure out immediately that bat here is an animal. And the reason is because the word sleeping is there and the verb was is there. So we know that non-living things can't sleep. So obviously this has to be the animal bat. But how would a model know? Because a model is just a bunch of weights. It doesn't have the whole perspective and context which is there in our brain. So this is where the concept of self-attention comes in that assuming you feed in enough contextual sentences, uh, these words, as you can see, as it goes in each encoding, uh, in each attention layer across the encoding layers, you can see that these weights represented by the arrows become stronger because they influence the embedding representation for the word bat. So the whole idea here is that the fixed size embedding vector for the word bat, those numbers will get changed and influenced by these other words like sleeping. So that could give an indication that it is an animal and that indication can only happen in the embedding representation. That's it, right? There is no like a thought concept in case of uh, uh, deep learning models. You can only represent that thought or concept using the embedding. And like I said, in summary, self-potential allows the model to look at other positions in your input sequence of words for clues that can lead to a better encoding or an embedding representation for every word. And multi-headed attention is you use that same self-potential layer, but you use different variants of it, where you try to encode different aspects with regard to uh, the different words again. So if you see here, uh, like I said, in every encoder decoder layer, uh, sorry, in every encoder layer, there will be multiple self-attention heads. And you can see these colors, there are around eight self-attention heads. And each of these uh, self-attention, these heads uh, have a different weight with regard to each word, as you can see, as they try to influence other words in that same sentence. So considering this sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, the word it, what does it mean? We know immediately it's an animal, but how does the machine learn that? So this is a classic case of uh, co-reference uh, resolution where we are trying to figure out what the word it means. And you can see from different attention heads here that a combination of the word animal as well as animal being tired. So both of these embedding representations are kind of contributing towards influencing the embedding for the word it. So the word it will have kind of similar representations as a combination from the embeddings of animal and tire. So that is where don't just use one self-attention uh, layer, but use multiple variants of it. That becomes your multi-headed attention. So transformer model architectures, there are various types of transformer models. Autoregressive models are more generative in nature, which focuses on generating text. And that is basically preferred on the classic language modeling task as the next token. It uses only the decoder block of the transformer. And the most famous uh, models are the GPT family of models, you know, GPT-1, 2, and now recently GPT-3 was released. I'm pretty sure all of you have heard about it. Auto encoding models or transformer models correspond to only the encoder block of the transformer. They get access to the full inputs. And what happens is during the pre-training phase, it goes through a task known as a mask language modeling, where we will pass in the full sequence of text, but we will mask out or corrupt certain input sequence tokens and try to make the model guess those tokens. That is how it will learn the embedding representations. The BERT family of models are popular models for the autoencoder family of transformers. Sequence to sequence transformers use both the encoder and decoder like BART from Facebook, T5, and so on. And they can, use, uh, they can be used for translation, summarization, question answering. And multimodal models use text images and so on. Again, I haven't worked really with multimodal transformer models. Uh, popular transform models, GPT-2 and now GPT-3 uses the decoder stack of the transformers, just to summarize, and BERT uses the encoder stack. Uh, so understanding a bit about BERT and distilled BERT, since we will be using this today for our classification uh, scenario tutorial. Like I said, BERT base uses around 12 encoder layers, so the encoder block is used for 
uh, training the BERT model. And if you're using BERT large, it'll have 24 uh, encoder layers. Be careful though, because these models use a lot, a lot of compute. So you really have to think about what is the best way to potentially, um, what is the best way to potentially use this depending on the infrastructure you have. So be careful about that. Uh, so BERT training, let's briefly talk about this. With regard to BERT training, the pre-training phase is where the BERT model is trained from scratch. That is where we pass in a lot of data, or rather let's say Google has passed in a lot of data like uh, books, uh, Wikipedia, Common Crawl, and so on. And the idea here is to predict the masked words. Like I said, the sequence of words, some tokens will be uh, corrupted or masked out. And the idea is can they learn uh, the representations and predict those tokens correctly. And it is also trained on another task called next sentence prediction, where it will be uh, basically the first one is an unsupervised task. The ne next one is a supervised task where you will pass in two sentences. And the idea for BERT is to predict whether the next sentence entails the previous one. So whether the next sentence is the right next sentence to follow the previous sentence. So that is also another pre-training task. So usually we don't care about this because this is done and by Google and other folks, but of course you can also do it no, like no one is stopping us from doing this. But our main focus is point number two, where we focus on the adaptation phase, where once we have the pre-trained model uh, from the pre-training phase, we fine tune it for our own purpose in terms of building a classification model and so on. And mass language modeling, as you can see here, so you pass in a sequence of text and before you pass it in uh, with the representation for every word, you mask out some of the words. And the whole idea is can the model predict those masked words? That is the first step in pre-training. Next step in pre-training word is the next sentence prediction where you pass in two sentences again, as you can see, separated by the SCP tokens. And then basically what BERT needs to do is predict whether the next sentence is indeed the next sentence or not the next sentence correctly. And challenges with the massive size of pre-trained models, as you know that uh, with the newer advent or the new, newest trend is, can we build a better transformer model which can outperform the previous models on given benchmarks? And we have seen that with time, we are getting more and more complex models with a lot of parameters out there. And what we are also noticing is that these models become really hard to train and even fine tune for that matter. You need a lot of infrastructure. As you know, like GPT-3 probably has out surpassed so like almost all the other models, most probably it has around 175 billion parameters if I'm not wrong. So the idea is can we have some models which can still give as good performance as some of these larger transformer models, but uh, really reduce the number of parameters in those models. So that is where distal boat from hugging phase has been a real uh, success where it tries to achieve like 95% performance of BERT, but almost like halves the number of parameters, as you can see here. And it does that using some concepts uh, called compression, uh, where it uses knowledge distillation, also to be more specific, teacher student training, where it trains a student model to mimic the output distribution of the original teacher model, the BERT model, and it is trained with a cross entropy on the soft targets, which are the probabilities from the teacher model, not the actual uh, class labels. And it uses the KL divergence loss to train this model. Do check out their blog link here. Uh, anyway, the slides will be shared where they talk about this model in more detail. So let's move on to the hands-on tutorials. Um, I'll just quickly go to the notebook. So it's available on my GitHub, by the way. And as I said before, the link is uh, bit.ly slash lmnlp underscore ds20. So if you go to this link, you will be redirected to my GitHub. And what you need to do is uh, basically go to the tutorial section. Uh, where there will be two notebooks. So we'll start with the text classification notebook and we'll end with the multitask uh, for transformers, multitask natural language processing. So I've basically opened these notebooks in Colab. You can use uh, your own environment on the cloud or on a local system, but it's uh, required or encouraged to use a GPU whenever you will try these models. So I'll not walk through the code line by line, obviously, because uh, this is just a one hour session and I guess I have only 20 to 25 minutes remaining. So I'll walk through the main uh, code blocks, which will talk about the methodologies which we are using. And you can refer to this code uh, offline and feel free to even reach out to me, ask questions on the Discord server, and I'll help you out. 
So these are some of the frameworks we'll be using, FastX from Facebook, TensorFlow 2, uh, Transformers, and some pre-trained models from TensorFlow Hub. So feel free to install Transformers when you try out this tutorial because you will be needing that package from Hugging Face, by the way. So what we do is uh, we are using TensorFlow version 2.3 and TensorFlow Hub version 0.8, as you can see here. Uh, since it's TensorFlow 2, by default, the eager execution mode is enabled because TensorFlow 1 is deprecated, so it's not recommended to use it. By the way, you can use PyTorch also for those folks who uh, like, like using PyTorch more. It's nothing different, just that the model flavor will change. So what I'm doing is I will be taking a classic benchmark data set to keep things simple. This is the IMDb large movie reviews data set. It has a balanced data set typically of positive and negative reviews. The whole idea of this is you have a movie review and you have a sentiment associated with it, whether the review is a positive, whether one or zero, a negative review. And the whole idea is to predict this. So what we'll do is we have 50,000 of these reviews and we'll transform this into a small data uh, availability problem where we will train our model on only 5,000 reviews. We will use, let's say, 5,000 more reviews for validation, and we will actually test our model, let's say, on 40,000 reviews and kind of check the performance. Luckily, we have label data, so we can do a, a golden or a ground truth comparison. But imagine if you didn't have label data. This is a way in which you could potentially leverage some of these pre-trained models and kind of see what kind of performance you're getting. So uh, again, I've been really lazy here, but uh, you can use random splitting also and shuffling, but I've just taken the first 5,000 reviews for training, next 5,000 for validation, and the last 30,000, sorry, 40,000 reviews, as you can see, for testing. We'll do some basic text pre-processing here. Something to remember, uh, models like BERT and uh, like even universal sentence encoder for that matter, you can pass in the text directly, by the way, because these have been pre-trained, as I said, on different uh, corpora of text. You don't need to do these additional pre-processing steps in that case. So keeping things simple, what we do is we just uh, strip out the HTML tags from our text data using uh, Beautiful Soup, a popular library out there. Uh, in Python, and we get just the text data from the movie review, remove the HTMLs, remove any extra new lines and carriage returns. Uh, what we do then is we lowercase our text. We remove any accented characters by encoding the text in ASCII format. So any kind of accented letters get re not removed, but encoded to its corresponding English counterpart. Uh, we remove the contractions or we fix the contractions. So contractions are words like isn't, gets expanded into is not, and so on. Uh, we keep only the text, as you can see with the regular expression, the text and the numbers using this regular expression here. We remove any special characters and we remove finally any extra spaces and strip them out. So this is what we do here. And then we basically run our function to pre-process our training data, our validation data, and our test data. So what we do first is since this is a benchmark data set, let's build a simple baseline model to see can we build a better model than that. So we build a simple logistic regression model with a bag of words feature where you know bag of words is basically every word becomes a feature and the value is the number of times that word is occurring for a particular movie review. So this is where we are using count vectorizer. And you can see that we have 5,000 training reviews and 40,000 test reviews. Uh, our vocabulary is of size 21646, so there are 21646 words as a feature vector for every document. And then we train a simple logistic regression model here, standard uh, fit, and then predict on the test data. And you can see here we get a nice 85% uh, F1 score as well as accuracy for that matter if you check it. So this becomes a baseline because obviously it's a benchmark data set and it's nicely balanced as you can see here. Uh, so it's not like it's a uh, data set which is particularly hard to get above 80%. So now the idea is can we build a better model which can beat this baseline? That will be our aim. So the first step is fast text embeddings plus a CNN model as we talked about. So this is where the first step here, what we need to do for any of these models where we pass the text in a sequence of words is to create a vocabulary. So this is where we are using tensorflow.keras and we are using the tokenizer class from the preprocessing.txt module. And we are fitting this on our training data. So that is what we typically do because our vocabulary should always be only on the training data. It shouldn't be on the validation of test data, right? We don't want to overfit 
not even overfit. We don't want to bias a model with future information, let's say, or information which shouldn't be a part of the training. So we fit it only on the training data. And you can see that we also put a pad token because we need to pad the sequences of reviews which are shorter than the maximum sequence length, which we will take shortly. So you can see we have a total of around 39,233 tokens or words, which is our vocabulary. And we have a total of 5,000 reviews in our training data. So once we build this vocabulary, what we do is we convert the text as we, if you remember the movie was good, gets converted into numbers like 257 and so on. So we use our vocabulary mapping to convert every movie review into a sequence of numbers. So that is where we use the text to sequences function. And then we do something where we visualize the distribution. So on our training data, as you can see here, we plot a histogram to see what is the typical length of the movie reviews in terms of the number of words or tokens. And you can see here that the sequence on the 500 should be a decent sequence because it covers more than uh, like 75 to 80% of the movie reviews. So that is what we set our maximum sequence length to. You can set it to 1,000 or even more than that if you want, but that is what we have set to. So what that means is that when we use pad sequences uh, with the maximum sequence length, every sentence of words will be padded uh, or truncated to a sequence length of 500. So sentences longer than 500 tokens will be truncated to the first 500 tokens and sequences with less than 500 tokens will be padded to have a length of 500. The reason for doing this is because we will be training our model in batches of data. And if your batch of data has different sequences, then your model will error out saying dimension mismatch. So that is the reason we need to have uniform sequence length for every input sentence coming in. And then we use the FastX model where we have downloaded this uh, pre-trained embedding representation, which has, as you can see, 300 dimensional embeddings for more than 2 million word vectors. And this was trained by Facebook, most probably on the common crawl corpus. As you can see, more than 600 billion tokens. So what we do is we set our embedding size to 300. The reason is because these pre-trained embeddings are usually available of size 300 and then uh, we set our epochs to 100, but we will use some early stopping so that we don't need to overfit our models. And we set a batch size to 128, which means 128 reviews at a time will be passed through the model and the gradient update will get done as we keep passing batches of data. And then what we do is we use this function. So you can check out this function later on also, but what this is doing is this is taking those 2 million uh, word representations 300 dimensional representations, and it is compressing it to extract out only those common words which are there in my corpus. So ultimately when I call this function here, it will look through our uh, mapping, it will look through our vocabulary ultimately because that is the input it will take. And then it will basically generate the embedding representation. As you remember, we had 39,233 words. So it will generate the 300 dimensional representations for that. Something to remember is that it is possible that some of your words may not be there on the corpus which FastX had trained on. So that is where we just initialize it with a random normal distribution of weights for 300 values. So that is also an important aspect which you might need to do whenever you don't get uh, one of those uh, words which are in common with what Facebook had trained on. So the whole idea here is to get the pre-populated or pre-trained uh, embedding layer for all our words instead of randomly initializing it. And then we pass in this into our embedding layer, as you can see. So we are initializing or pre-initializing our embedding layer with these pre-trained weights instead of randomly training from scratch. And we are also setting trainable to true uh, so that we can basically uh, learn or update these embeddings also as we tune it or train it on our data set. We don't just keep it fixed with Facebook's representations. We will tune it also with gradient updates as back propagation happens across multiple epochs. And then we use a standard architecture, as you can see, a conf 1D with 256 filters, a kernel size of five, so it will take in five words at a time and it will pass the convolution filter and slide it across. Uh, we pass a max pooling layer after that and we use uh, three of these layers of conf and max pooling. Uh, then we flatten the final representation and pass it through two dense layers with some dropouts. So this is a, like a standard architecture which we are using. And final, as you can see, layer is one, obviously, uh, one neuron or one unit to predict the 
output as a one or zero. That's why you use a binary cross entropy loss with a atom optimizer. Standard architecture pretty much. And then we train our model. This is where we are using early stopping as you can see, uh, which means that if it has noticed that the validation loss is not decreasing across two consecutive epochs, it will stop the training. So we don't end up overfitting our model too much. And that is what we do here. And as you can see, after four epochs, we pretty much uh, start, uh, the validation loss starts increasing. So the training stops immediately. And then we predict the performance on a test data. And we can see we get a nice accuracy of one score of 87%. So definitely much better than uh, what we had as our baseline, which is a good start. Now the next part is leveraging fast text embeddings along with a bi-directional LSTM and attention layer. So this is the same process. I won't go through this in the interest of time, but again, you need to follow the same uh, methodology here, right? Because you need to pass in a sequence of text. So uh, build your tokenizer, generate the vocabulary, convert your text to, to the sequence of words, uh, visualize this, set a maximum sequence length, pad the sequences to have a fixed size sequence for each and every review in your training validation and test, and then Let's talk about the attention layer. So remember, there were three main equations in the attention layer. The one is where we have a learnable neural network function, which will work on the hidden states. We have the softmax to compute those normalized weights. And then we have the final context vector generation by taking a weighted sum or an average. So these three here, you can see this attention layer is a custom layer we have built using a tfkeras.layers dot layer API from TensorFlow. And again, this is also available open source based on a research paper, feel free to check it out. But what we typically do here is we initialize our weights and biases, as you can see, with some random weights typically. And then what we do is, uh, as you can see, so this is the Gloro uniform initializer, as we talked about. There are multiple types of ra random initialization methods. So what we do is we use this here, self.init, we use it to randomly initialize our weights our biases. And then during the call function, when we call this layer, what will happen is it will compute the EIG. And as you can see, this EIG is basically the WHT plus B, and we apply a tan H nonlinearity on top of that. That is exactly what happens. And once that is done, what we do is we compute those alpha weights. So for the alpha weights, what happens is we compute, as you can see, the exponent. Uh, so if you remember here, the formula for the softmax here is you need to compute the exponent of ET, and then you need to divide by the summation of the exponents. So that is exactly what is happening here. To compute the alpha T, we get the exponent, and then we also sum those exponents, right? We sum those exponents, and then we finally compute the softmax. So that is where we compute the softmax here, as you can see, by taking a sum of all the exponents which we computed in this line, right? So we compute the exponents of the nonlinearity activation output, and then we divide it by the sum of those exponents to get the softmax weights or the softmax weights of every hidden state. And then we just multiply it and form the context vector. So that is basically the context vector which gets passed into the downstream fully connected layers. So now we will be using this custom attention layer in our model. So given that I'm running out of time also, uh, I'll just walk through this quickly. Again, we are using this exact same function what we used before to load up our pre-trained uh, embeddings from Facebook, the fast text embeddings. We are extracting out only the embedding representations, which we need here, if you remember, by calling this function. And then what we are doing is we are populating the embedding layer again in the same way with these fast text embeddings, setting the trainable to true. Uh, plugging in a bi-directional LSTM layer where we return all the hidden states, return all the hidden sequences. We don't just return the last one. That is where we set return sequences to, tr to true. And then we plug this into the attention layer, as you can see. And then finally, the output from the attention layer, which is your context vector, gets into the dense layers and finally the output layer. And once we train this model again in a similar way, we use early stopping and you can see that the performance is around 86%, which is slightly worse than what we got in our uh, CNN model, but still better than our baseline. Uh, next one is the universal sentence encoder models, uh, the universal embedding. So for the neural network language model, the whole idea is you have these variable length texts. You can load in the pre-trained model from TensorFlow Hub. 
So as you can see in TensorFlow Hub, TensorFlow has open sourced the model as well as the weights. So what you can do is you can take this URL and you can pass it to the Keras layer API from TensorFlow Hub, which we had imported earlier. And you mentioned that the output dimensions is going to be 128 sized fixed vectors. And the input is going to be a string where we will pass a variable and string directly. And we are setting the trainable to true. So if you call this, you will see that for these sentences, if I'm calling this um, API now, this layer which I've built from the API, I start getting these vector representations for each of the reviews. Now the idea is can I plug this with a neural network with uh, some dense layers and then the output, uh, then the output uh, layer. So that is where we plug in our hub layer, which we defined earlier, just to motivate the fact what we had done earlier. We are initializing the NNLM model using the Keras layer. So this layer we are plugging into our sequential API model from tensorflow.keras. We are then plugging in some downstream dense layers and the output layer, that's it. So this simple model, you then just train it and use an early stopping again. And then you can see you get a pretty decent performance again, 87%. And the balance is also pretty good with regard to the number of correct predictions and errors. So overall, you get a pretty decent performance again, 87%. And for Google Universal Sentence Encoder, again, it is pretty much a similar format where you take in the training reviews, you plug it into the Universal Sentence Encoder pre-trained model from TensorFlow Hub. So this is where, again, what we do is we take in this model we pass it to a Keras layer object, say that the input is df.string. The only changes, the dimension, if you remember, will be of size 512. And then we take in this and plug it to, again, a similar dense layers and the output layer, and we train this model. And then you can see here that uh, we get a pretty decent performance, almost 87.5% uh, on the test data. So kind of similar performance across all these previous models with a 1% uh, performance uh, gain or drop here and there. Now the whole perspective about BERT is BERT uses a different type of tokenization called uh, word piece tokenization based on byte pair encoding. So very rare words like let's say calling, it will be broken into smaller sub words like call and some special token ing. So in this way, it represents the much rarer words and it will have a representation for each of these sub words. So, we use Hugging Faces uh, bird tokenizer here. We load that up because it will have the full vocabulary uh, tokens and the mapping. And then what we do is we create the token. So what we do here is we just lowercase our text. That's it. We don't do any pre-processing. We tokenize it using the bird, uh, the bird tokenizer, the word piece tokenizer. And then we append CLS and SAP. We surround the tokens with CLS and SAP because that is how bird expects the inputs. So CLS and then all the tokens and then SCP. And we also have to add in two things. One is the mask. So typically in the pre-training phase, BERT expects tokens to be masked, but since we are not masking or hiding any tokens, all our mask IDs are always zero. And we are not doing next sentence prediction also. So for us, the segment ID will also be zero. If you are passing in two sequences of sentences, the segment IDs for the first sentence would be zero. The next one would be one. But in our case, we are only concerned with classification. So we have one sentence, so all the segment IDs are zero. So we use this tokenizer to tokenize our sentence. And as you can see here that uh, this is how BERT expects the input to be passed to it, right? It has the input vocabulary IDs of every word. It has the mask IDs, which are zero in our case, and the segment IDs. And that goes as inputs to the BERT model, which we are using from the Transformers API again, the BERT based on case model. If you want to use PyTorch, you would need to remove the TF part of it. Since I'm using TensorFlow 2, I'm using the TF BERT model. And then I basically plug this into, again, some dense layers and the output layer, right? Uh, similar architecture, basically. Just the only thing which changes is this one, one line code, thanks to Transformers API. And then what we do is we convert our input data. We convert our train reviews, our validation reviews uh, into uh, basically the tokens. So this is where, as you can see, we have these input IDs coming in and then we uh, train these models here. And we train this model here using, again, the same early stopping. And uh, basically, we train it for only three epochs. As you can see, it does take a fair bit of time uh, because uh, this model is a huge model with over, uh, sorry for scrolling up, but over 110,000 
uh, 110 million parameters almost. So this is where we basically convert the data in the format births, birth needs and train our model. And when we predict it, again, we need to get the test feature IDs, the vocabulary ID, the mask ID, and the segment ID. And then when we predict it using this as an input, you can see we have reached a 92% performance. So that is where I think BERT really outperforms all the other models, as you can see, uh, even with less data. So since I'm out of time, I won't go through the distal BERT model, but just to motivate the fact, you just need to use the TF distal BERT model again here. And when you make the predictions, you'll see that you will get kind of like a 91% performance. So in this case, you only need the vocabulary ID and the mask ID. The API format is exactly the same. So feel free to check out the code. I will wrap up quickly in a minute by just talking about some of the other possibilities of using transformers. So thanks to the pipeline framework from transformers, you can easily load up a model and you can use it for different tasks like sentiment analysis. You can just load pipeline sentiment analysis and you can call this on different text data in the future. And as you can see, it can handle negation also, like this movie was so not good and it will identify that this is a negative sentence. So you can easily use out of the box pre-trained transformer models really easily here. And you can use them for different things like even question answering where you have a whole context of data on COVID-19. You can basically build a question answering pipeline here just by calling pipeline of question answering and you can ask questions like what is a coronavirus, what is COVID-19, and you can see that you will get near accurate performance on this uh, on even new data because this model has been trained on so much data and even on the squad data set for that matter. And the last one I will want to talk about is summarization where I've used the BART model from Facebook. And again, I've passed in a huge text document. And if you pass this in, you'd see you get a nice summary about COVID-19, it's a pan global pandemic and so on. So the whole perspective here is that transformers have really revolutionized the whole perspective about deep transfer learning. So just wrapping up uh, my presentation, uh, these are the research papers I've shared in the GitHub link and uh, these are the references. So thanks to all these great content creators out there for providing the visuals and the content also, which I've shared today. Hopefully this was useful. Uh, these are my social links in case you have more questions. Feel free to reach out on the Discord server in Manning or feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And thanks a lot. Hopefully this was useful. Yeah. Hello everyone. I'm Hamsa Shweta, data scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Pasadena. Hope you all are staying safe and sane during these unprecedented times. And coincidentally, in this presentation, we are going to talk about answering some of the key questions related to COVID-19 using natural language processing techniques. Curiosity is what sets humans aside from the other species. So that's the reason we all have and ask a lot of questions in every walk of life, every moment. Some questions are hard, some are difficult or might not have conclusive answers, not that we know of, and some are topical essential questions of immediate relevance and need. So we will have more questions coming and including the ones that we already have, which means we need answers. And more than that, it's great if we came up with streamlined processes or pipelines that can help us find answers easily and probably quickly. In this presentation, we will talk about building one such pipeline called Topical, which can do just that. But before we delve deep into the uh, pipeline itself, let's step back a little and look at how the data set looks like. Recently, the White House and a coalition of leading research groups came up with a COVID-19 open research dataset. So there are around 29,000 research articles and of them, 13,000 have full text in them. And all of these are related to COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 and related coronaviruses. And all of these together make up the COVID-19 dataset. There are high priority scientific questions which are of immediate need to the medical experts to find solutions to some of the problems that coronaviruses are posing. And the community needs answers. But to find where the answers could be located, we do not have any labels 
and we also do not have a team of subject matter experts who can help us find the location of the answers. So we have two options. Either ask every question to every article which is tedious or we need a way to capture the article such that a we know the range of topics that the articles are talking about and thus decide the questions to be asked and b is to reduce the number of articles or the paragraphs themselves that we ask questions on since as we will see later BERT and square data sets impose restrictions on the sequence length of the context so why topical and how does it work? In this pipeline, we use two unsupervised and state-of-the-art NLP techniques, topic models and Q, BERT QA models. Topic modeling is to understand the hidden topics in the articles using word clues from the questions and fetches relevant articles of interest. And we then use the BERT model which is applied to the square dataset to fetch us possible answers. Topic models are a way of organizing and summarizing a large collection of documents which would otherwise be impossible by human annotation. It helps us discover the hidden thematic structure and also topics emerge with analysis of original text under algorithms assumptions. LDA is the most simplest topic model that we all use and it tries to capture the intuition that documents exhibit multiple topics and it tries to start statistically model this. But whatever we come up with should be transparent and interpretable because we are dealing with the medical domain and the global pandemic that is keeping us all masked at home and at two arms length. But what is the need for hierarchical modeling and inference? Abstracts are generally sources of dense information and succinct in explaining main topics of a given paper. The underlying topic distributions for the abstracts are hence not a very accurate measure of the topic distributions in the articles themselves. However, Topics in the articles tend to be widely distributed in aspects of related works, experiments, datasets, which may or may not be descriptive of the crux of the articles. This reasoning backs our hypothesis to build two separate models, one for abstracts and one for the body uh, of the text, uh, and use them for hierarchical inference to get a reduced number of paragraphs. Formal definition according to the author of the topic model is that topic is a distribution over the fixed vocabulary. It is possible that we set priors to particular word topic combinations such that we nudge models to converge in a required direction. We used guided LDA or open source library to set seats to the particular topic combinations. And we also used the hyperparameter tuning in the GenSim Python library that offers the LDA. We qualitatively evaluated the topic models, also iterated this with a medical researcher to see if it made sense to a medical expert at all. And for the visualization, we used PyLDAVIS, a Python library that can help visualize the topic models generated by Jensen. The data pre-processing on the entire uh, corpus included removing the citations, combining all of the sections in a given article into one giant blob of text. In the first pass, the abstracts for each of the journal were taken and topic models were trained over 100 iterations. And we all know that it's hard to choose the number of topics. It's a hyperparameter that we have to tune by running multiple experiments. But we chose 10 topics for 10 questions such that we could seed words from each of these questions to a topic. After obtaining topic models, we use them to find a do dominant topic for each abstract and then save them as an additional column. Similarly, topic models for articles were also built and dominant topics were saved.
Let's now look at our heavy hammer for the QA modeling. BERT BERT is a bidirectionally trained unsupervised language model with deeper sense of context and has the ability to comprehend better. And this is the reason that it is currently the state of the art to solve many downstream tasks, including question answering. But how can BERT answer questions? BERT, as we know, can be fine-tuned on Stanford question answering dataset such that it learns two extra vectors for start and end of the answer. And to fine-tune, train, and inference, we used Google Cloud Platform and also use the Collab Notebooks to do this fine-tuning as we can see on the right. Using TPUs resulted in faster training and inference times. We used two BERT models. One is the original Google BERT and we also chose BioBERT, the reason being that it was fine-tuned on PubMed papers that is well suited for our task. On evaluation of these two models, we noticed that BioBERT resulted in 84% F1 score as opposed to BERT's 78% F1 score, and thus our final deployment used BioBERT. So how do we perform inference? Let's take a question. Perform tokenization, remove stop words, and convert them to lowercase, and pass them on to the abstract topic model for inference. And this topic model will give us out a set of topics. This set of topics that we obtain will be used to filter the articles from the corpus. On the filtered article sections, we run the body topic models to get their dominant topics and in turn match them with the question's topic IDs. Choosing the sections in the articles that match them will reduce the inference time by at least 40% on a GPU and also results in quicker iterations on the other questions that are pending to be asked. This architecture on the left sums up how different libraries, cloud platforms, notebooks from 2020 Data Scientist Toolbox came together to answer some of the critical questions about the pandemic. Currently, the model is residing in a TF-serving Docker container with client-side code built in. On the right-hand side are the snapshots of the answers from the pipeline. Here are the awesome people in the COVID-19 NLP team at JPL who worked on cool visualizations, to exploratory data analysis and pre-processing, to understanding the correlations, and to feature extractions. Thank you. I'm Ekaterina, uh, and I'm an affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge, and I'm also working on the uh, book for Mang, uh, where I'm uh, explaining how you can get started in this field of natural language processing from the very beginning. So the whole idea is that uh, the field right now is very popular, it's on the rise, and there are lots of very cool techniques with natural language processing that you would like to know about. However, if you don't know anything about natural language processing, this book is for you. So here is the link that you can follow, and parts of this book are already available online through the early access program with Manu. And the code that uh, accompanies the book is also available on my GitHub page. So in fact, today we're going to look into one of the uh, introductory chapters from the book. We will uh, code together. Uh, we will go through the steps of this algorithm together. And I hope you will learn a bit more how you can start in this field. And also the idea that I would like to transmit here is that in fact, the barrier to starting in this exciting field is uh, quite low if you know where to start. So first of all, what is natural language processing? Uh, I do understand that all of you here are uh, gathered because of your interest in natural language processing, and perhaps you already have quite a good idea of what you want to do in this field, and you know 
uh, was to work on. Nevertheless, I think it still uh, makes sense to briefly go over the basics of nature language processing and where it stands compared to the other fields. So the particular application that we will look into here is spam detection. Um, I will go over a couple of reasons for why spam detection was chosen for this live session and what is so good about this application as, say, a starting point, an example for why you might be interested in coding something like that. So it's going to be a hands-on experience session. You will implement your own NLP application completely from scratch. So first things first, what do we actually mean by nature language processing and where does it stand on the line with all the other fields that are related to it? If you go online, if you Google for it and uh, say ask uh, the um, ask Google, ask the uh, websites, what is nature language processing? You would find out the uh, definitions for nature language processing that will tell you that this is a branch of artificial intelligence. And indeed, if we think about what intelligence is, language capacity is one of those key and very essential skills which are part of our intelligence. So when we build intelligence algorithms, uh, uh, the ability to understand natural human language and the ability to generate natural human language is one of those key bits. That's why we say that natural language processing is part of artificial intelligence. Computer science, Lots of things that we uh, do in natural language processing are algorithms. So that's where the connection to computer science comes from. So those algorithms are computer science algorithms necessarily. Finally, linguistics, and in particular, computational linguistics. That's where the field of natural language processing started. And even if these days it moves more and more towards the technical domains, and we might say it's actually enabled and inspired by machine learning quite a lot, Linguistics is still a very important bit of it because that's where we learn how language works and that's where we learn what actual language is. So machine learning is a very important part of this uh, picture and we will see today how to apply a machine learning algorithm to learn something from the data about the language. So what are examples of natural language processing? Uh, you might think hmm, that's such a great field, but I know nothing about it. In fact, I'm going to tell you, you're using natural language processing every day. So every time you search for something in your browser, for example, or say on your computer, you are using the techniques that are called information search. So that's one of the key and uh, one of the very widely spread popular applications of natural language processing. Secondly, autocorrection, text prediction, that's where you type something on your phones. These days, most smartphones have this technology that allows uh, you to basically just select among the options what is the most probable one that will follow from the context that you are talking about. You might also come across a smart reply from Google. That's where, for instance, the, um, the email client may even uh, compose the whole email on your behalf. That's also an example of NLP technology being put in practice in our everyday lives. Intelligent virtual assistants, uh, that's Siri, Alexa, all those types of things. And I know there is actually a talk about that later on, so you will learn more about that. And this is this particular application in real life that, again, many of us are using. Machine translation. If you ever try to translate uh, a sentence, any text, anything from one language to another, these days it's um, surprisingly and amazingly easy to do. You just go to Google Translate, uh, or maybe you have some other application that can do machine translation for you. And within one click of a button, here you have the translation of the input text. So uh, very easy. However, we are going to look at a particular application, spam detection here. And for spam detection, the problem is uh, formulated as such. So you get an email. You know that some of those emails you get to your uh, inbox, those are totally fine, normal emails. They are quite often as opposed to spam called spam. Other types of emails might be fishy emails. There might be something wrong about them. Those are spam ones. and. Um, uh, the reasons they are spam is that the content suggests that there is something wrong about them. So, of course, here in this visualization, I highlighted other things that might suggest to you that this email is a spam one. 
So there are all sorts of capitalization issues. There are uh, the fonts, the colors, uh, the URLs that are included in the email. All of those are very useful types of information that you might use as well. However, the key point here is that the content itself might already suggest that the email is in fact spam. So we are going to apply the natural language processing techniques to the emails, and we are going to learn to predict that something is a spam simply based on the content. So what do we do here? Uh, we are applying a machine learning algorithm to predict uh, whether something is a ham, normal email, or a spam. So uh, why exactly spam detection is, uh, has been selected as the algorithm and as an application in focus here for the talk today? It's because we're using it actively in everyday life, just as we are using predictive technologies or information search and so on. And if you've never actually even thought about that, that you're using it in your everyday life, that's probably because you're quite happy with your spam filter. So detection that we are going to perform here will depend strictly on the content analysis. That's where NLP techniques are the most useful. We are saying that it's a classical application of classification techniques. Uh, in particular, we are distinguishing between just two classes here, spam versus ham or normal emails. And by the end of the session, hopefully you will have an idea that what we are talking about here, it's not just about spam filtering itself, it's actually quite a powerful framework that can be applied across many tasks in nature language processing, as well as across other domains. So what we are going to do in essence is we will take the data, it's highlighted in different colors here. So it may be from one class like ham, or it may be something that should be sent to the spam box. We will analyze this data automatically, extracting features. The features will be uh, represented by words extracted from the email. And we will build a function that will map these words to the output class. Then when we get a new email, it may be a whole email or it may be just one phrase. We will play around with different things here. The goal will be to predict whether something is a spam or a ham. So uh, this hands-on session that we're going to start now will show you how to implement your own spam detection algorithm or to that effect, any binary classification algorithm that you can apply to uh, in a language domain as well as in any other domain. Uh, we will go, we are going to implement this completely from scratch and you will see that it takes no more than say 100 lines of Python code. We will be using a Jupyter notebook, which is uh, this cool, uh, toolkits that we can apply where we can uh, do this interactive live coding and we can basically play around with different settings and so on and get the results instantaneously. And the only tools and uh, the data set that we will uh, need for this session is the Nature Language Processing Toolkit, an LTK, that you can download from this link here. And we will be using a data set where spam and normal emails have already been collected for us. So feel free to actually apply this technology to your own uh, spam emails, see whether it works just as well on your own emails. But the particular reason for why we are using Enron data set here is because it's open access, widely available data sets that has been collected specifically for these purposes and has been used before in spam analysis. You can also download this from my GitHub page that accompanies the book. So the whole package together with the data and the code is available there as well. So I'll give you a, a minute to uh, note this down if you would like to follow my coding just as is in a live mode. Go to the NLTK web page and install it. It basically takes um, uh, ba not too long. And then also download this data set either by searching for Enron download. So you can follow uh, this link to my GitHub account and download it directly from them. Okay, so at this point, uh, I'm going to turn to the um, notebook and I'm going to uh, start sharing from there. Okay, so if you have downloaded the data from the GitHub page, you would see a folder that contains uh, these two uh, folders with the data set. So we are going to uh, use Enron 1, just to give you a heads up. The Enron 1 data set, the folder contains uh, the 
subfolders where the uh, normal ham emails as well as spam emails have been conveniently separated into two subfolders. So that makes our task quite easy. We are just extracting the data from either ham or spam, and we know what the labels for each of those emails are. So the full code is available in chapter two. We are starting from scratch. We're going to implement this from the very first steps. So let's see what we need to first of all use here and which functionality from Python will be useful for our application. So first of all, let's import the OS functionality so that we can read from those directories and extract the data from the textual files. And we will also need a codex to read from the textual files themselves. So let's define a function. Let's call it uh, read in to read the textual data in. And we will pass in a folder as an argument to this function so that we can open it and read the contents of the files. So within this folder, for that we are going to use, um, yeah, so I suppose that uh, then you haven't seen the, um, what I was showing with the data set as well. So in here, uh, we have uh, two folders, uh, in Enron 1 and Enron 2. So uh, let's iterate through the folder. Let's store the files in this, um, uh, in this data structure for the files. The list of files is going to be extracted with a uh, list dir over the folder. And we are going to create a list where we will store the contents from those files. So for a file, uh, for a file in this directory, in files, uh, sometimes if you have downloaded it from the web page, for example, from GitHub, you would see that uh, there might be some hidden files here. So let's just make sure that we are not reading from something that is not really the textual file. So this is just a precaution. So if a file, uh, a file name starts, oh, sorry, starts uh, with a, uh, a dot, which means that it is a hidden file that we don't want to work with. Let's read it with a codex. So we will open the file from the folder plus a file name. Uh, we are going to read from this file. Let's make sure that the encoding is correct. So in this particular case, we are working with uh, this type of files. And let's also make sure that all the errors are ignored in uh, the process. Okay, so now we have opened the file and we are going to populate the list with the contents of each of those files. So what we are going to do here is we are appending to the list um, file read which basically will store the contents of the file extracted from it. And after we've done that, let's close the file and let's return the list of files. Okay, so now, uh, as we have initialized this uh, and defined this function here, let's get the two lists of uh, data the spam list and uh, the ham list. So spam list is going to read the files that come from the spam folder. The spam folder is located in Enron 1, spam, so the subfolder within this uh, folder that we have downloaded. Let's look into that, explore this a bit, so we can first of all print out how many uh, spam messages we are going to work with. So let's just print out the uh, length of this file, uh, the file list. And let's also take a look into, say, the very first spam message in this uh, list. So we say spam list, the first one uh, in this list. So now we do the same with uh, ham emails. So we say ham list, read in, 
um, and and run one ham. This is where all our textual files with the normal emails are contained. And let's print out uh, the length of the ham list as well as uh, bits from the very first email from the ham list. So here we go. What we have in these data sets uh, is 1,500 spam emails and uh, 3,672 ham emails. The very first message that we have uh, looks like that. So as you can see, there are um, some things that already suggest that the content is not really uh, normal. So uh, you might get an idea that it is indeed a spam email. Uh, the second one uh, is a longer email that probably is uh, something work-related. So this one here is an example of a ham email. So that is a normal email that is contained in this data set. Okay, so that means that we have uh, initialized the two uh, data structures, the two lists that represent our ham and spam emails. So now uh, we need to put them together and we need to make sure that the algorithm knows what is the content and what is the label for each of those emails. So let's import uh, random from Python to allow us to make sure that when we combine this data together, uh, we will have uh, a random that is fair, unbiased representation of the data. So let's create a structure, all emails, that will keep uh, both types of emails together. But we also need to make sure that uh, this structure knows what is spam and what is ham. So for each email from the spam list, we're going to store a tuple in this uh, list for email content mapped with a label. So the label will be spam for each email in spam list. So basically what we are doing here is we are iterating through all of the emails. So we store them as such here. A reminder above here, we have already looked into the content of the very first uh, bit, the very first item in the list. So we are now iterating through all of them. We are storing in all emails, the tuples where we are mapping the content to the label. Now we also need to add to all emails, the email contents from the ham messages. So exactly the same thing. We're going to say email contents and it will be mapped with ham label for an email or email content uh, in ham list. Now we have combined both types of data together and uh, they are now all stored in all emails together with the mapped labels. So let's now uh, shuffle them randomly. And for that, we would need to, first of all, initialize some random seeds. So this basically can be any random number here. The point is that once you've done it and you run your algorithm once, next time you come back to your notebook, you should be able to replicate your results and you should be able to get the same results again. If you don't uh, set this random seed and just apply the random shuffling, no problem. However, you might not be able to get exactly the same results and exactly the same shuffling next time you run the notebook. So now let's apply a uh, random shuffle to the uh, data. So we pass in all emails. And after we've done that, uh, let's check that uh, we have the all of the emails combined together. So we can do that by printing uh, the length of the data structure. And if everything worked correctly, what we will see is 1,500 plus 3,672 emails altogether in this data structure. So we say uh, data set size equals, and then we apply string on top of the length of all emails.
So let's see. Okay, so the total data set size is 5,172, which is exactly the combination of all ham emails from here and all spam emails from here. So now comes the time when we uh, need to apply the natural language processing techniques to actually work with this data. So, so far we have the data structures. However, they do come in as simply this um, collection of characters, if you wish. So it's just a sequence of symbols for the computer. So what we see as humans in these texts is that each one of those is a separate word. So we might be uh, learning from each of those words and from the presence and distribution of these words. For example, if we see working, if we see project and so on and so forth, probably uh, it's more likely that this email is a normal ham email. However, if we see lots of uh, strange words that suggest that it might be some suspicious email, we would assume that this is a spam email. So the computer in the first place doesn't have any idea what we are talking about here. It doesn't know what uh, a word is and doesn't have this concept. So that's where we need to apply tokenization. And in the previous talk, um, you have already come across these terms and you uh, might know what it is. However, uh, the computer wouldn't know how to do that straight away. So we're going to apply an LTK and in particular from an LTK, we will need to import words tokenize. So this is exactly the um, tool within an LTK that will allow us to split the text into words in a smart way. So for instance, it would take care of the punctuation marks. It would take care of such things as this here. So it will return the list of words on top of whatever text we pass in. So let's now um, extract the features from our files, from our texts. So the list of features that we will be working with uh, is going to be very simple. So this is the starting point. If in the future you would like to improve this algorithm, you're welcome to do so. In the very first uh, place, we're going to use the uh, presence of particular words within the text as features. So let's say uh, get features. We will be passing in the text. So this will allow, allow us to work with any input text whatsoever. So we're going to extract features. This will be a dictionary where for each word, we will uh, associate the presence or absence flag of this word in the email. So let's collect a list of words, which is going to be words for words in words tokenize applied to our text. And to make sure we are talking about the same types of words, we can also put the text to lowercase. That's one other sort of option that you may explore here. For instance, if you believe that capitalization um, encodes some very important feature for spam detection, you may not uh, put your text in lowercase. But for consistency, let's do that here. So that's how you can actually apply lowercase and then word tokenization on top of that in one line of code. So now for words in word list, we are going to store within the features um, dictionary. So in features, we will as associate with each word that does occur in text, a true label. So we'll say this word did occur in this email. So that's it. That's how we collect the features. And at this point, we return the features as the output. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's collect all the features together. So we say all features is a list of um, get features applied to an email and associated with the label for each tuple in all emails. So what we are doing here we are passing in this structure where we have the tuples with the text itself and the associated label. And now we are converting this structure 
into the features. So now each email is going to be represented by this list of features that occurs in the email. Okay, let's see how it works. And we can uh, basically, for instance, apply it to some um, email of our choice. So we can say, what would be the features in a particular email, in a particular sentence and so on. So for example, if I say participate uh, in our lottery now. So let's see what will be the features returned by this algorithm. Okay, so as you can see now, every word that occurs here is assigned a true flag. That means all the other words from the uh, data set, uh, those that do not occur in this uh, sentence will be assigned by default a tag that will be false. So we are going to learn from the uh, presence and absence of such features in the data set, uh, what tells us something about the spam and ham content. So now if we check what is the length of our uh, all features, and we can also check a couple of other things, like for example, how many uh, features, how many features, how many words are present in any of our emails. So like, for example, we can say all features, the very first email, which is accessible at the um, uh, ID one and or index one, uh, index zero, which will represent the very first email in uh, the data sets. And also if we access the uh, number of features from here with uh, the index of zero, let's see how many are there. We can also check how many uh, features will be in the hundredth email, for instance. So let's see what comes back here. Okay, so uh, because we have applied this algorithm to uh, our full set of uh, 5,172 emails. That's exactly what's returned here. So for each of those, we have a list of features that are present in each email. For the very first email, we have uh, 27 features present. For the uh, 100th email, we have 18 features present. So now let's apply the classification algorithm. And again, we can uh, rely on the functionality of an LTK here. It's pretty easy to do that. So we say that from an LTK, we import naive base classifier and the classify um, technique or the classify methods that we will apply to basically classify something in our data. So let's now define a function that will be called train we will apply this to our features. And because within machine learning algorithms, we want to separate the training data from the test data, we can do that by specifying the proportion of those cases that we would like to consider for the training data. And the rest will be sent to the test data that we will test our algorithm on. So let's see how we can do that. First of all, we say train size uh, is the uh, length of our features. So that is, we make sure how many features do we have, how many uh, in general, how many of those data points we are working with. This should be 5,172 uh, as we've seen before. And now we are um, multiplying this with the uh, proportion that we uh, pass in. So for example, if we are setting 80% of the data for the training set, this will be the proportion that we will pass in here. Now, what we uh, keep in the train set will be all the data points up to this, uh, this point here. So that's where we uh, set the boundary between the training set and the test set. So we initialize the two structures here now. We say train set, test set, and we are passing in the features from uh, the data set up to train size. And the rest will go to the test set. Okay, 
So let's make sure that everything works correctly. So let's print out, first of all, uh, the training set size and secondly, the test set size. So we can do it in the very same way as we did before. So we say, what's the length of the train set? And we can do the same for the test set size. Okay, so that's what tell us whether uh, it's working correctly. Um, once we've done that, uh, let's also initialize the classifier. So the classifier will be uh, the one that we are using from here. So naive base. We will apply it to uh, the uh, training set. Uh, and the way to do that is to say naive base classifier dot train. And we apply this to the train set. This is how we can do that with an LTK. Now let's return as the result of this uh, approach, the train set, the test set, and the classifier itself, so that we can uh, apply this further to any new data and classify new examples as well. So now let's get the train test, uh, the train and test sets, and the classifier as the output of this uh, function train here where we are passing in all features and we are going to use 80% of the data for the training sets and the rest should be put in the test set. So here is the uh, size of each of the data structures. If you calculate the proportions, this will be about 80% of the data and the rest is the test set. So that's it. We have now changed the classifier. And the next step for us is to see how well it performs on the data. So that's uh, at that point, let's implement one more uh, technique or one more approach. Uh, we are going to evaluate how well our classifier performs. So let's pass in the trained set, the test set, uh, and the classifier as the uh, arguments to the function, which we can call evaluate, for example. So we're going to print two uh, measures here. First of all, uh, we're going to print the classification accuracy. That is how well the classifier performs, how many of those ham and spam emails it identifies correctly uh, on the training set itself. So let's see how well we can capture the data from the training set. So how does it perform on the training sets? Again, stream applies to the classify accuracy. And here within the classify accuracy, we take the classifier, we apply it to the uh, training sets. So uh, we do the following. So we say classifier and we specify which set we are applying it to. Okay, so at this point it's train set, and this will be uh, the accuracy on the training set. So let's do the same on the test set and compare the results on the two sets. So hopefully we will see that our classifier performs uh, quite well on both sets. So that's the idea. One more thing that an LTK allows us to do is to take a look at, into the most informative features. So those will be the words that show up being quite helpful uh, in the classification of the data sets and in the classification approach in general. So we are going to say here, classifier show most informative. So this comes in as part of the uh, NLTK uh, library, which is available for the classifier algorithms. And here we can print out, uh, so show most informative features. Uh, and uh, here we can print out the full list of those features, but it might actually be a bit overwhelming. So let's print out the top 50, for example. 
Okay, so at this point, let's uh, evaluate the performance of our classifier on the training test sets and return the most informative features. Okay, here are the results. As you can see, the training set accuracy uh, is sort of expected to be higher. Uh, hopefully, uh, if everything is captured exactly correctly, uh, you would get 100% accuracy. However, it might be unrealistic because another thing that the classifier tries to do is to build the model that is generalizable enough. So that means it would uh, compromise the accuracy on the training set to capture all those different uh, phenomena in the um, data sets and uh, something that is actually about the task itself rather than about the training data. However, the good news is that both on the training set and on the test set, we are getting pretty good accuracy. So that means in 96% uh, of the cases in the training data, we are predicting the output correctly. And in 95% of the uh, uh, test cases, we are also predicting correctly what is ham and what is spam. Here is uh, the representation of the most informative features. So these weights here tell us how much more likely the classifier believes uh, seeing this feature in uh, a particular email or the class of emails is compared to the other class. So for instance, uh, forwarded is a word that is very specific for ham messages. So it's much more likely to occur in ham messages than it is in spam messages. However, prescription, uh, not surprisingly, shows up in um, spam messages much more likely and much more frequently. So some of those things you might find surprising, like spam itself, uh, in fact, suggests that it's a spam, medications occur in spam, and so on. So uh, in case you find uh, any of the um, occurrences of the words surprising, and you would like to uh, have a look into how the word is used across the different emails, with an LTK, you can also do that. So there is a fun functionality that allows you to investigate what's the context that is surrounding the word in different texts. The way to do that is using an LTK's um, interface for text. So from um, an LTK text, we import this functionality, which is called text. And uh, let's define a function, which we will call core condense. This stands for the uh, occurrence of the words in the surrounding context of other words. So let's pass in uh, a data list and the words that we are going to investigate the co-occurrences for. So let's call it search words. So we might select any of those words from the list, especially if you find something quite um, unexpected or surprising and you would like to search for it, feel free to insert it here as a search word. So now for email in uh, the data list, Uh, we are going to um, take the word list. So that is very similar to what we have done before with tokenization. So we take the words for words in um, words tokenize on top of the email uh, that we pass in here. So once again, we can put it in uh, to lowercase or we can keep capitalization if we would like to do so. And now uh, the way to extract the context would be as follows. So we say text list is this function text from here applied to the word list. So now we have split the email into constituent words and we have applied text on top of this word list so that now we know if the word occurs in this word list, we want to see the surrounding words. So if search words, is in word list, let's print out the co-occurrences of this word. So we take the text list and uh, we uh, extract the concordances, the surrounding context from the, from the word list for um, this search word. So we say concordance for the search word. Okay, so 
Now we can investigate different contexts for different words in different word lists or different data structures. So for instance, if you have found out anything that you find surprising and would like to investigate further, you can do that. I found uh, during some of those iterations that a word like stocks or like stock options and so on occurs both in ham and spam. Or for example, uh, I was interested in seeing how stocks are used across both data structures. So let's see how it is used in ham. And the way to do that is to pass in, uh, it into this um, function here. So we say concordance. Uh, for that here, we will use ham list because this is the collection that represents our ham emails and the search word itself is stocks. So this will be for um, the ham list. Now, what happens in the spam emails? So let's also print out what happens there. Uh, let's say uh, stocks in spam. And here, instead of uh, ham list, we are passing in spam list. Okay, so indeed, we can see that stocks are used in spam, in ham messages, but compare these occurrences. So there are some repetitions, so obviously some emails have been sent multiple times. Perhaps it was also some mailing list or so. However, all together, we have uh, stocks occurring in ham emails four times. And every time it occurs in an email just once. So that's what this uh, message here, displaying one of one matches, tells us. In comparison, when we look into the spam messages, we see that stocks occurs multiple times across many, many emails from uh, the spam messages, sometimes as many as four times within the same email. So that just gives you an idea of how the data is differently distributed, how the words are used in different ways across the different data structures and collections of and classes within this um, data set. Now, we have seen what the accuracy is. We know how it performs on our data set here. Uh, what about new messages? Can we classify those now? Uh, the answer is yes, of course. We can now uh, define any new emails. Like for example, let's define a test spam list. And here let's input any emails that we might think would be spam emails. So how about uh, my favorite from before? Uh, participate uh, in our new lottery. Uh, and for example, something like uh, try out this new medicine. That will be my new spam list. And let's also define some new uh, ham emails. So for that here, um, I won't be very creative. I will just see some, say something about meetings or maybe something work related. So I'll say, uh, see the minutes uh, from the last meeting attached. And maybe something else like uh, investors are coming to our office on Monday. Okay, so those are our new data structures. But once again, uh, these are simply the sequences of symbols for the machine. So right now, first of all, we need to convert those into the correct representation. So we need to extract words and represent them as uh, features. So we'll say test emails uh, will be uh, email content mapped with spam for email content uh, in test spam list. So note that we are doing a very similar thing to what we've done before when we process the data set. So now we also need to append all those emails that we have from the ham bit of the new test set. So simply like that. So now we have test ham list, we process it, we extract the content. Uh, now we have a uh, new test set uh, in which we are going to store the features for those um, data structures.
So then you tell set, extract the content, and now apply the function from before. So instead of the text themselves, we are going to store the features uh, on top of the email and the label for the tuples containing emails and a uh, label. emails and now let's apply the evaluation so we evaluate uh, train set the new test set so note the difference now we are applying this to the set of new emails and you could have uh, inserted or inputted any other emails that you would like and this is our classifier that we have trained before on our previous training set so let's see what it says now. Great. So on this very small test set, uh, it achieves or obtains 100% accuracy. So it classifies everything exactly correctly. Uh, this set of informative features is returned by our evaluate function, and it will be exactly the same as before, of course, because it has been built previously on the training data. So uh, if we want to print out the particular results for each of those emails, we can say uh, for email uh, in test spam list. Let's print out the email itself and let's print out the predicted label. And the way to access the predicted label is to say classifier classify the uh, email, so we get features from the email, and we apply the classification on top of those features. So let's see what it says here. So for every spam email that we have here, it predicts that it's a, uh, ha uh, it's a spam email, which is exactly correct. And now we can do the same with all the ham emails. And if you have inserted a different data here, you would get a, like, a similar result, hopefully. So this is the email. This is what our classifier believes it is. So now can we apply this to uh, any other inputs? So for example, can we integrate this with some further um, program, some further techniques that we have? Well, we can do that. So uh, let's now get an interactive input from the keyboard. So let's say that we are going to read it from the keyboard. Uh, for as long as a user provides some email. So uh, that means let's uh, extract the input from uh, here. So we say uh, type in your email here or press enter. So enter will be our way out. So if the user presses enter, then we uh, will stop this loop. Otherwise, if we read an email, so if its length um, is, uh, uh, if its length is zero, so this is uh, when the, uh, the user pressed enter, we uh, exit this loop. And otherwise, they're going to apply the same uh, techniques from before. So the prediction will be classifier uh, applied to uh, the features extracted from this email. And we are going to print out the results here. So we will say uh, this email is likely. And here we are going to um, return the prediction of the algorithm. That is the label that our classifier beliefs should be assigned to this um, email. So here we go. Uh, now you can play around with this algorithm. You can go uh, with it forever, like inserting the different um, messages. You can say, buy new meds. And it says, uh, this email is likely spam. You can say, uh, buy meds here. This is spam. You can say, uh, let's actually apply this to something with stock options. Get your stock options. 
So according to the statistics from these data sets, uh, the classifier believes this is likely a spam message. Uh, well, how about something um, something normal? Like for example, let's uh, schedule a meeting for tomorrow. Okay, this is likely ham, so uh, it wouldn't be sent to a spam folder. So as I said, we can go with this loop forever until we press enter. And at that point, it exits the loop and we are done. So um, I hope you have enjoyed this session. So um, uh, then implement uh, something like that, something like a binary classification approach uh, easily uh, within this quite limited number of uh, lines of code, in fact, using a particular toolkit for the natural language processing called uh, an LTK. So uh, if you have any other task that you would like to work with, and uh, it's something that relates to language and contains two classes, like, for example, very simple case, uh, like, uh, say, uh, sentiment analysis, positive, negative, uh, in fact, you can uh, try as a starting point applying something like that, an algorithm that uh, will provide you with a very simple baseline um, performance on any binary task. So uh, at this point, uh, I will be happy to answer your questions if there are any. Uh, I think there is also an open chat uh, in a different channel. So please let me know. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed it. Hi, and welcome to my talk. My name is Matthias Tanha, and my talk is about getting familiar with transformers in NLP. Um, this will be a sort of a high level um, talk on transformers, um, and there'll be some um, demo slash showing my uh, Jupyter notebook there um, at the end. So starting with the outline, um, I'll start with just giving a, you know, a short summary of who I am uh, and what I've been up to. Um, and then I'll go into a sort of a brief introduction to natural language processing and the different tasks of that, followed by um, the developments leading to transformers architecture. So it will be sort of somewhat of a chronological you know, um, sequence of events that, that led to the tra transformers architecture that is uh, widely used today. Um, after that, I will uh, go and just uh, show the Hugging Face um, uh, website, which is a Python library um, for using transformers. It's, it's, it's a very good library. And also the, the squad website, um, um, because for the demo, I will, show, I will use um, the squad, which is a Stanford um, question answering data set. Um, so just getting familiar. And then I'll go through my pre-prepared uh, Jupyter notebook um, slash demo. Um, and with that, I'm going to start um, telling about myself. So I started with um, studying chemical engineering um, at uh, the World Institute of Technology. Um, I did my master's there. And after that, I got interested in more theoretical chemistry, uh, which led me to Carnegie Mellon um, University in the US to do my PhD in computational chemistry and um, applied machine learning. Um, and it was at this point where I really got fascinated with sort of the applications of machine learning. And given my interest of language prior to that, I, natural language processing was definitely a route that I was interested in, in continuing. And um, by my final year, I started to getting involved in startups um, in, in, in US. And then I finally moved to UK to join an incubator there. Um, uh, and I've been you know, around doing startups with different solutions for natural language processing since then. Currently, I'm um, you know, working uh, with um, or on Human Lambdas, um, which is a company working with um, uh, providing human in the loop solutions, and, and it's basically an AI tooling, and AlphaQuants, which um, provides, it's a fintech company providing NLP solutions for um, getting financial data or, or related to finance data. Um, and yeah, that's a brief uh, 
you know, background of, of where, where I'm from. And with that, uh, let's start with natural language processing. So to me, natural language processing, I guess in one sentence would be algorithms that understand human language. So this can be either with, you know, statistical approaches like machine learning, or it could be more in like in with reason or, or any sort of mate. But, but the, the point of it is to make computers understand the human language. Um, and this is very, very current right now, um, just because we have an, a lot of unstructured data um, available. Um, and unstructured meaning, um, you know, anything from, you know, um, articles, news articles, you know, scientific articles, um, any sort of text, um, voice, or even social media text, which is quite different from, from article text. Um, and so the, the challenge essentially of NLP is to um, make sense of in this unstructured data and make it in a way that computers can use it to do predictions or different tasks. And these tasks, um, some of them um, I've listed here um, are like language translation. So inputting one language, text in one language and having the machine produce um, the same content, but in a different language. Um, text summarization, where you have a lot of text and you want to sort of compress it into a smaller amount, but still keep the, the sort of flavor of what this text is talking about. Um, information retrieval, um, I put question answering in this as well, uh, which is essentially if you have a lot of textual data and you're searching for a particular answer in, that, in this data or, or, or you want to get a specific document in this data, um, sort of a search in a library, for instance, um, or any sort of search in, in textual space. Um, and uh, my last example is, is named entity recognition as well, which is finding entities or, or recognizing a particular entity in a given text. So an example would be if you were interested in getting to know all the um, all the companies mentioned in an article. So you want the computer to sort of highlight those companies or, or extract those those names of those companies. Um, and these are all solutions that 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 um, that have been developed. Um, uh, but you know the that and with the transformers we've got quite far in, in, in all of these actually. Um, so Let's go to sort of the beginning, um, the first part, which I said, which is computers understanding words or, or, or language. Um, so the first thing is the words. Um, and computers don't understand words. Um, so what is needed is for words to get mapped into some sort of a representation space or a embedding space. Um, and these are done with sort of word embeddings. Um, um, uh, nice. This 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 graph actually, which I really liked, was it sort of gives an explanation of of how um, these like sort of word vectors or word embeddings um, can be seen. So you you sort of have this, you know, uh, several dimensions where where you can which you place each word, you know, semantic meaning in. Um, and here, like for instance, you can see that. You know, you have these dimensions, which is like animal, domesticated, pet, fluffy. Um, usually these are not exactly known what these different dimensions are, but just for learning purposes and, and understanding sort of how word vectors work, this, I thought this is a good graph where we can see, you know, that different words are, are positioned different places in these different dim dimensions. And a more like, you know, visual sort of a view of this is, is sort of seeing um, these different words uh, in this different uh, you know, spaces uh, in, in these different dimensions and seeing that there are some connections between them. So the semantic meaning of these words are still sort of understood. Um, so that's the first part. The first part is like to understand um, words and what they are. The second thing is sort of the, 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 the sequence of things, the, where, where we position things. Um, sort of, you know, if you're looking at like grammar or or how we structure sentences, actually that makes a difference. So um, this is um, um, 
this is the second sort of thing that that we needed to have computers understand, right? So that there is a sequ sequential dependency in, in language. Um, here I've taken an example of a dependency tree of you know a simple sentence like Peter likes salad, um, and uh, the ordering here does make make a difference, and that's why um, you know methods such as like auto regressive methods where uh, meaning where, where they take consideration of the ordering and the sequence, the temporal sequence of, of the data um, was sort of the first, you know, larger, like big jump that, that we took in NLP, that was taken in NLP um, to sort of make computers understand language better. And this was first done with um, recurrent neural networks. Well, not first, but um, at some point this came through. And, and actually this was quite early on as well. Um, which um, are neural networks which keep a sort of a memory of you know the previous inputs so that there is a sort of um, the sequential information is passed on um, and to the left you can see um, is the the general structure of it and to the right is just the unrolled one so you know we input each um, X and it will just keep you know um, the output of of of, of each um, action is also passed to the next action, for instance, um, and that way it sort of keeps um, memory of that. The the sort of best um, performing one in this case was um, a, a cell which was called the long uh, long short short term um, memory um, because what was important here is also that. You wanted to sort of have, um, you want to keep a sort of a longer term memory of, of what has been said because some sentences can be very complex as well. Uh, but for the time, this, the, the, the LSTM or the recurrent neural networks did really well. And then we went into the space of um, neural, neural machine translation. And that's where a lot of developments happened actually. So what happened here was that. Um, these like sequence model, like the 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 recurrent neural networks, um, were put together. So you had a, a structure of an encoder and a decoder. So what this meant is that you would have um, some sort of a, um, the sequential input data would would be converted into an encoder vector, and then that vector would be then um, fed into another recurrent neural network that would decode that information. And for translation, this makes a lot of sense. So you would input, you know, um, the sequence of, of 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 a sentence in one language, and then this would output the the sequence in another language. Um, the problem was the long sentences, which is a problem of these um, recurrent neural networks in general. That it can that the there's a decay of memory, right? So the the most the 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 the, the closest uh, there there is a there's a bigger weight a larger weight on the word just before the one that you're predicting um, rather than sort of a free um, uh, a memory where you can look anywhere in the sentence and and this was a problem that that we can even see if we look at you know the, the actual structure of a of a sentence. It's not always as simple, you know. It, here we can see another example that Wiki is my pet dog, um, and we can see that the the structure is not just that the the word just before the other one next to each other one are the ones that are most important to the other one, um, and uh, and so yeah. So then came this this sort of the beginning of 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 what what transformers were were made, and and this is still in sort of the the machine translation. Um, so here we can see a, a graph of, of um, the attention. So attention is the weight put on the word in the entire sentence. So here we can see on the on the left side it's in French um, going down vertically um, the sentence and to the right is the same sentence in English. Um, and the intensity of of the the brightness of of, of these different words um, or the intersection of these words are sort of 
showing how much weight was put in um, or how much attention uh, was was put in on these words. And if you can see, it's sort of diagonal, but but at some point you can see that the weight between um, between environment and environment, which are not diagonal to each other, is more. So so here we can see that the attention was put more on the correct place. And what this did is it does it allows to to keep a sort of more selective memory rather than just um, you know having the weight being mostly on the previous input. Um, and so this this weight was essentially calculated calculated in between the encoder and the decoder. So looking at the the output language and the input language, the weight was was sort of calculated. Uh, and the attention mechanism is essentially just putting the focus on the right sort of uh, input uh, word. And then um, there is this more sophisticated uh, model or more, more developed model, which, which is self-attention, which is just looking at within the sentence, how does each word relate within the sentence to the other words in the, in the sentence? Um, and and this also has has been a great importance for um, what what comes to be the transformers. Um, so because with this, it's essentially just focusing on how the 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 language the the sentence um, is structured, and it's independent on how long the sentence is, because you you can still relate back to something further back in in the in the sentence. So that brings us to transformers. And there's a few points of the transformers that are that are sort of essential that that have made a big difference to 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 NLP. Um, the first thing is this uh, attention mechanism, which in transformers is called multi-head attention mechanism, uh, which I will go through in the next slide. Um, and what is if we look at the sort of the, the architecture here, um, you first see that you have the imp input embedding, which is first taking the word into uh, the embedding space, so the representation of the word. Um, and then the other thing is that that's very important is the positional encoding. And what the posi positional encoding does is that it it um, keeps track of of where this word is um, positioned in the sentence. So each sentence, uh, each word is given a sort of a tag of where it's positioned in a given sentence. And with the positional encoding and the intention, there was no more need for any sort of uh, recurrent neural nets. And this is the big change into transformers. And the big advantage of this um, is also that there was no need of the sequential um, training, which was both taking a lot of time and was not able to do in parallel. So in a sense, this allowed um, you know, um, these models to be trained in parallel and allowing to do training on much larger data sets. Um, and this also allowed us, us to use those for, to train larger models that could be used for transfer learning. Um, so it would essentially be trained to on Big part, a lot of um, text, um, and and then you can use those pre-trained models to then optimize for various tasks. Um, and in 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 the transformer sort of um, language, or or it there are two parts. So there's the pre-trained one, which is the when you train the model to learn general knowledge about the language. And then you can fine tune models to sort of get more specific tasks, um, such as you know, um, name density recognition, text summarization, or all these different tasks mentioned in the beginning. Um, and the the pre training part, the good thing about it is also that it's unsupervised. Um, I will get into a more specific example, you know, after in in, in a few slides. Um, so looking at the multi-head self-attention, um, so the first part, if we go back here, actually, the, 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 one, the, the section to the left, which is the encoder, um, 
um, is the main part that we want to focus on for, for this talk um, because um, the sort of pre-trained models is mainly um, using the left the encoder only to train the, to get the pre-trained model. Um, in some cases, such as um, language um, translation, then the the right part is used. But in other cases, it's only the left part used and um, just added another classifier on top. So on the left side, we mainly the the multi-head self-attention. What it does is that it you feed in these things which are called um, the the value key and the query. Um, basically, this this is the the value and the key and the query like the value and the key. Um, sort of you you use these. It, it's still the it's the tokens from the the embeddings from the the sentence themselves that you do a scale dot product to get a sort of a weight of how much important there is for for each of those words. So um, I'm not going to get in very deep on on how these are um, these is calculated, but in in essence, the the sort of nomenclature of this comes uh, of the same sense that information retrieval or search is is done, where you have you know a query and you're looking for um, you search by different keys and then you have the value and that's sort of the same sort of method that that they want to want you to think about attention as well where you have you know I'm I have this word I want to know which other word is related to it and then I'll put the weight on it to give out how much attention to put on it um, and what 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 um, is really useful here is also that um, you can have several layers of attention and each layer of these attention can have different focuses. So here to the right you can see that um, that uh, if you take the word it in this sentence you can see that there's the first layer here that different colors are different layers of the attention. They focus on different parts of the sentence. And that can be um, different sort of um, different uh, uh, features that you're looking for in sort of relation. Um, an example that I actually liked a lot here was, you know, if we take the, the sentence, I kicked the ball, uh, and we're doing a self-attention on that, then we can have this sort of multi-head, so the, the multiple uh, layers of, of the, the attention. And each of them can represent different things. So the first, like the, the one in green, for, uh, is sort of looking at who, you know, kicked. And the red one is looking at did what. And the, the blue one is um, sort of looking for to whom. And so, I mean, the, the way I see it, I, I'm not sure if how many people are familiar with, with sort of um, uh, uh, convolutional nets, but but it's sort of uh, I see it as similar to to filters um, in that. Uh, but basically, using these different sort of attention uh, layers gives the allowance to sort of understand how different words are related to each other in different sense. Um, and this can be grammatical ones or other things. Um, and it also helps with. Um, something called co-referencing, which is when you have two sentences, um, and in the first sentence, you you say, um, for instance, if there's two sentences and one of the sentences is, um, Mary had a lamb, she was nice, um, then it will understand where, where the she is referring to um, in the previous sentence. Um, and so the one, the, the one very famous um, sort of transformer uh, uh, model was, uh, or, or is still, I guess, BERT, um, which is, uh, is called BERT, short for bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. Um, and this model is essentially doing two things um, that it's optimized for. One is that it is masking um, it, it, it's using a mask language modeling, which is that it's masking some of the um, words in in a in a sentence, 
and trying to use the context to predict them. Uh, so here you can see that you have the different words inputted and the different per word, um, words um, predicted. And you see that the fourth word here is masked. And using all these inputs, we're trying to predict also the fourth word. And then you're training with that. And the other thing it's doing is also something called next sentence prediction, where it's essentially taking two sentences and seeing if they're related or not. So it's doing these sort of both optimizations of these two things um, with the transformer encoder, um, the transformer architect with, with the attention mechanism in it. And it's using up a lot of parameters. To give a more better example there, for instance, if you feed into to BERT, the doctor ran to the emergency room to see mask pa patient, it predicts what that word mask is. Um, and in this case, it with, with a certain percentage, it predicted his with the highest percentage. All the other ones actually make sense as well, um, but this was the one that it, it, it predicted. Um, and this BERT is, the BERT model is actually been, uh, one of the big ones, but but the problem here is that as these transformers, as you can see in this graph, um, has progressed. Um, so you have the time in the bottom, and the y-axis is the number of parameters, uh, number of million parameters. You can see that the number of parameters have increased by a lot, um, and the the problem is that these these methods have performed really, really well, but it also has been computationally quite expensive as well um, to get a more and more accurate one. Um, there have become, uh, uh, if you look at the more recent ones, um, this is not completely updated, but you can see that there are some models that are have fewer, so, so the sort of compression of, of the parameters have been occurring, and actually they have been uh, doing pretty well. Um, and that's the that's with pruning or, or something called distil, distilling, um, which I'm not gonna get into now. Um, so um, coming to more the more practical parts of this, um, we have Hugging Face, um, which is a Python library for using transformers. Um, I'm gonna go into the website to sort of show um, how this, this is set up. Um, I will get into the demo of, of showing you know how to use it as well, but first I want to show the the website where you have these all these uh, models trained that you can use, um, and you can see that there are different sort of uh, tasks that like models that have been trained on different tasks. Um, so if you take, for example, text classification, you can see that there's a bunch of them here. Um, you can do um, question answering. And if you go into each of these, you can see how many people have used them um, and how to set, use, like set up the model. Um, some of them have some statistics also on how well they've, they, they're they performing. Um, see if I can, yeah, so I think if you take this one, you can see. Yeah, it has a little bit more information. Um, and I think at the bottom you have, yeah, the evaluation results. Um, and let me see, going by. So we're gonna do a um, actual more practical uh, um, demonstration with that. Um, but I'm first gonna go and explain about Squad, which is the Stanford question answering data set, um, which is essentially a subset of uh, uh, Wikipedia with a set of questions and annotated answers. Um, I'm going to go and show you the website here as well. So if you go to the website here, you can see that there is um, actually a ranking of how these different models have are doing um, for question answering. Um, for the people that don't know what question answering is, it's essentially when you ask a text a, a question or, or you ask a question and input the the text as well, um, so a Wikipedia article, for instance, um, 
and the 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 machine or the model will will provide you of the location of the answer exactly. I'll, I'll demonstrate that here as well. But um, so here you can see the 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 top performing the leaderboard uh, on this data set, and as you can see here, like is you know all of these are different transformers more or less, um, apart from human performance, which is not doing as good. Good. So this is exact match, and this is the F1 score. Um, and yeah, um, you can see that actually these models perform really, really well, which was not possible at all before transformers. Um, and so if we go and explore the data set a bit, um, so this is one model and, and you can, this is the data set. So if we take, for instance, one of these um, contexts, you can see that this is the text. And then there we have the questions like, what is the largest city in Poland? And the ground truth is Warsaw, you know, and the prediction is Warsaw here we see. Um, and, you know, it shows where in the text the prediction was made and, and, and this is essentially how it works. It, it, it predicts um, the location of, of the, the text, where, where, uh, where in the text the answer is. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to go and show my pre-prepared um, Jupyter notebook. Um, so what I've done here is this is the, the first part is getting the data from, from Squad. Um, the Stanford question answering data set. Um, I pre-process the data here. So I load the data, I pre-process that um, in because I want to have it in triples of question, answer, and the paragraph. Um, it's called paragraph, context, text. Um, in this case, all of them would be the same. Um, so I essentially um, add these triples so I can have you know, easy access to sort of looking at all of them. And for this purpose, I'm just sampling, you know, 10, 10 samples of this, um, the question, answer, and, and, and context triple. Um, and then uh, I'm going to show how you can set up an easy question answer model with um, the Hugging Face Transformers. So the Hugging Face Transformers is um, uh, consists of two parts, which is the tokenizer, and the, the, the actual model for the fine-tuned model. Um, and you can actually, as I went before and showed in the, here in the, in the Hugging Face page, um, you can actually use any of these models. Um, so the one I'm, used, I'm, I'm using now here is, is uh, which one is it? Is the, the BERT large um, fine-tuned on squad. So it's actually, like pre-trained and fine-tuned on the this data set. Um, so hopefully it will do quite well. And then um, you set up the, the tokenizer um, with this line. You set up the model um, or load the model with this. And then you, I'm running through the questions, answers, and text. Um, so each question I'm, I'm running to um, I'm running through the tokenizer, um, and I'm running the question and the text, and then here, so the Hugging Face library, the transformers, you can use both with PyTorch and a TensorFlow. Um, these are different sort of um, libraries for using, for setting up neural networks. Um, I've for this chosen PT, which is a PyTorch. Um, and so it returns, you know, the tensors in PyTorch essentially, um, as PyTorch tensor. Sorry, um, and this does all the job of setting up the inputs in the right way. So it essentially tokenizes all the, the data, um, both the questions and the context. Um, and then I'll take the input IDs, and I convert the IDs to tokens here just to update the tokenizer again with the same IDs. Um, and then it's no more than just feeding in the inputs of that, that was created here into the model, which was initiated here. Um, and it outputs the answer start scores and the answer end scores. So these, these are two um, lists of, um, of uh, 
or actually they're in, in tensors, but but you can see them, think of them as lists um, of of the scores of how much uh, uh, where the start is, like where the model believes the start of that answer is and the end of the answer is. And then all, all we do here is just take the, because I'm using the PyTorch, I'm taking the argmax of that of the start score and setting it to the answer start. And I'm doing the same thing for the end score, um, plus one, just because I'm going to set the, the range. Um, and so these are the highest probability of the start and the end of, of where the answer, the model thinks the answer is to, to the, this question. And then I'm taking the IDs, the, the IDs of those, and then I'm converting the IDs into tokens, um, and then converting the tokens to strings. Um, and tokens, for, for people that don't know, is essentially the, the, the different um, com like um, parts of, of, a, of a sentence, so more or less words, actually. Um, so you can think of tokens as words in this case. Um, and then I convert the tokens to the string, so it will give the answers. And I've printed here um, all of the answers. Um, and I'm printing the question, the answer, the true answer, and or the true answers, because it's a list of answers. It could be several truths. Um, and the, the, the paragraph or the text. So we can see here first, the question is, what did Forbes halt in the construction uh, of, to, of in 2008? Um, that's a pretty strange question. Um, but here we can see that the true answers, um, there are none. But our model has found an answer. And this can be due to, um, I have not sort of calculated the score, uh, which I should, uh, of, of the model. And you can sort of discriminate based on the score. So in this case, I presume that the score would have been quite low for this answer. Um, I'm just taking the max in this case. Um, but if we look at the second question, we can see what is, the, is another name for the state route 168? Um, and the answer that, that our model gave is Sierra Freeway. And the, the ground truth is the Sierra Freeway, Sierra Freeway, or Sierra Freeway. And um, so we can see that it succeeded here. Um, and yeah, so it essentially has feed it in here and found the answer to that question. Um, and then I have a somewhere, actually this one here, it actually found the answer, even though the ground truth was not there. Um, but yeah, so we can see that the model works pretty well um, in this. Um, <clears throat> if you thought that this was quite, you know, bothersome and complicated, they actually have prov provided an even uh, more simple solution, the, the transformers, the hugging face for, for um, setting up this question answering. And that's by using uh, something they call pipeline. So this take care of all end to end um, uh, sort of um, setting up of, of the model. So you just import the pipeline, you uh, input the, the, the keyword question dash answering, and you actually don't even have to feed in the model or the tokenizer. Um, it, it will take one by default, but um, in this case, we've done that. And then all you do is you feed in the question and the context, um, which is in this case is the, is the paragraph. Um, and it will just give you uh, uh, answer as such. Um, so here we can see, I've gone through it here again, the same format. So you have the question, what did the Forbes halt the construction of in 2008? Um, uh, you can see that it's the same answer here again, um, but it also gives uh, uh, the start and the end position of, of the, of the, of the answer, um, corresponding actually to the index of this text. Um, so you can just use this and just pick the answer out there as well. And it also gives the score. So this is actually the preferred poly model if you just want to use it out of the box uh, and test it out. I would definitely recommend testing it out. Um, and um, 
and it only gives that the most um so it's the same as the previous one that i showed it only gives the highest the, the, the answer that it believes is the most correct um and not more um so if you want to do some sort of more complex things you, you should probably go back to the previous one where you get the 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 score uh list of the start and end <clears throat> so the i'm not going to get in more into um the other sort of um uh tasks but in in the same sort of um uh, in the same depth i'm just going to show that we can use pipelines for other tasks as well um so using and these are all just using the transformers one so you can initiate here again the pipeline with summarization and i've actually just inputted here the the context here um of a random um Part of the question and answer um, data set, and you set the the min minimum length to what you want the minimum length of the the uh, the summary to be, and this number is the number of tokens, um, and the maximum length. Um, so I've put it between ten and thirty, you know, character. Uh, I'm sorry, tokens, um, words, if you will, in this, if you want to be simple. Um, and I'm printing it. So here you can see that it returns um, the summary text. Um, and here is the entire text as well, which I, I print here as well. So the entire text is talking about the fraternities and sororities. And what this is, it's an it's a extractive summary. So it means that it extracts um, the actual sentences in, in the input text. So it's not generating new sentences. It's actually just finding which are the sentences that um, have the most meaning in the in 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 the or or have um, have the most um, have the most relevance to to the the entire text. Um, <clears throat> and we can see that it does pretty well. There are 15 fraternities and seven sororities at the University of Chicago in 2002. The associate director of of student activities estimated. Oh yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I think I probably cut it too short. So this should have been a bit longer. Um, so if I maybe do this 50, hopefully this will do. And I'll maybe bring this up to 30 instead. Um, so actually I'll do it to 40. Let's see if this, oh. oh, yes, I forgot that I haven't run anything. Yeah, hopefully this won't fail me now. <clears throat> While we're waiting on that, I'm going to go to the next one, I guess. Um, I told you that there's a lot of parameters, so this takes a little bit tedious. Oh, I didn't initiate that as well. Um, sorry about that. Um, Right, so um, the next thing is uh, named entity recognizer, which is um, extracting entities um, in text. Here again, it's the same thing. You just use the keyword um, near um, and you input the text. Actually, I saw this is done now, so let's just go back there first, sorry. Um, yeah, here, this is better. So you can see major events, also play a big part in tourism in Victoria, particularly cultural tourism and sports tourism. Most of these events are cent centered on Melbourne, but others occur in regional cities. Um, yeah, I mean, these, these input texts are quite short. So if you would do it with the longer one, you could see actually pretty impressive results. Um, yeah, so sorry. Um, continuing on name and recognizers, um, you feed in the text here again and what happens here is the same thing. It essentially gives back the word and a score and the entity. So this is the taxonomy. This is the more most common taxonomy, actually, that you know it says this is an organization um, that the university is. Um, and if you here see that, like you know, some words, if you look, for instance, here, it's uh, the pound sign and hell. This is because of the tokenization of um, of the model, uh, I'm not going to get into that, but 
but um, the different sort of transformers tokenize um, the text in different ways. So the way they sort of chunk the text into words is different. So some of them use subwords, and and this is a case of that. Um, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, <clears throat> for translation, um, for pipelines is quite limited actually, but they have English to French. I think they have English to German, um, a few others. Same thing here again. You input the text, um, and you initiate it with that keyword. You input the text. It gives you back, you know, the translation. Um, and this is French. Um, to my understanding, my three years of French, actually, I think it kind of made sense. Um, I'm not going to attempt to say it in French, but it essentially seems to do quite well. Um, and the last part is text generation. I don't know if you guys are aware of um, the sort of developments with GP3. So this is a, essentially a GPT model as well, uh, which is a transformer. Um, and here again, what happens is that you initiate the, the pipeline. The keyword is text generation. Um, you give it a context to initiate with. And here is as far as I am concerned, I will. And then you feed that in and they will give you a generated text. You can also set how long you want this to be, um, but it sort of makes sense. It, this could have been written by a human. As far as I'm concerned, I will not be getting killed by another human being for no reason, other than this is a matter for the court to decide. I believe the facts before me, and I will be doing the same for you all. Um, yeah, so basically, I think the Hugging Face um, provide really nice solution for using transformers. Um, I gave you a brief overview of, of sort of the, the transformers, uh, how they work. There's a lot more to it. Um, please like read up on it if you're interested. And that is all for my talk. Um, I think I will go to Discord now and wait for questions. Oh, um, right. So, uh, encoders and decoders are essentially an architecture of um, the different um, the different sort of structure that you can have um, for a neural network. So, so it's essentially setting up. Uh, recurrent neural network as an input and uh, if I can go back and show it actually. So this it's this structure where you have a recurrent neural network um, to uh, input the data and the output of the data is also another recurrent neural network. Um, and in between it, there's some sort of space where they're communicating. Um, so essentially, at the, 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 the place where it actually was very used was in um, that neural mach machine translation, where you have this sequencing input. So you're saying like, you know, um, it, like here you can see, I like cats more than dogs. And then it's translating this into Japanese here. So you have a recurrent neural network that is you're inputting this, this sequential data into, and it's transferring that information to another recurrent network, which, you know, sort of predicts the, the, the words in the other language. Um, so it's just the structure of, of, you know, one recurrent neural network, which you input and another recurrent neural network, which you output. And the input one is called encoder and the output one is called decoder. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll share the slides and everything. Um, I haven't set it up the notebook. I'll share that. Um, and let me see. A little bit of bias in the mask example. Yeah, there was a little bit of bias in that. Um, the, the bias is actually because of what it's trained on. Um, so based on what is trained on it, it actually will get a bias, right? So so that's 
the problem is the data that most of the text that is trained on is probably biased, right? Um, do you have any detailed tutorials uh, we can work through? I, I'll share um, a, a something more detailed um, that, that you can work through. Um, actually, that, that would be very good. I, I sort of had it difficult to like do something that would go through all of them. Um, uh, what's the difference between sequence to sequence versus transformer models? Um, so this, the difference is that the sequence to sequence is actually using recurrent neural networks. Um, so here, the the sequence to sequence is oh, sorry, the sequence to sequence is 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 something where you have the 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 input of each data like so whenever you input this word the the output of from this state is gone to the next state so there's a recurrent neural network here for transformers you're not using this this sort of uh, recurrent neural network anymore you're just relying on the attention completely so you're oh, sorry uh, let me. so what you're doing is you're uh, you're, by using this mechanism of, of, of attention, you don't need that recurrency anymore. So every like word is inputted. Um, so here, what's inputted is each word that's inputted here, it's not like none of that information is needed for the next word that's inputted. So that way you can parallelize it. Um, and, and so the difference is that you're not using recurrent neural networks. Or maybe I should have had a nicer picture for that. Um, what I think about Spark NLP. Um, I actually don't have too much um, experience with Spark NLP, um, so I'm not. I don't think I'm qualified to give an answer about that. Um, I'm sure it's good. I've I've used Spark before uh, for other things, but I haven't used Spark NLP. Um, I kind of feel bad that I'm not writing it back. I'm just talking it's so easy. Um, any semantic as well? Yes. So um, we actually do work with um, sort of, um, we do some information retrieval. Um, and actually, most of that has been in the space of sustainable. Uh, um, finance, so helping analysts find, because um, there's a lot of content about um, about how various companies are doing in in this space of um, uh, in the space of um, sustainability, like how they're performing with with like how many initiatives they're taking, um, and there's a lot of PDFs documents and reports on this. So we do actually, we've set up even a sort of question answering model for that um, by, you know, parsing through these, these reports. Um, so yes. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'll stay on Discord and answer anything. Um, so, yes, I mean, I don't know how much, um, search rank prediction is, is, so I, I, I guess like the, the, the thing I can say that is related, um, for information retrieval and, and transformers is sort of this question answering, which what you actually do um, that that actually we built a solution for as well is sort of this thing that when you have a lot of text and you want to do question answering on it, you need to, you can't do question answering on all of the text. You first need to re do the information retrieval of finding the, 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 the paragraph that is most relevant to the question. 
and, and that is sort of building a sort of a search rank prediction based um, where you find a relevant score. So then you have, you know, the, you, the most simplest way for that is to do some sort of a, a doc to vec model or some sort of a paragraph embedding. Uh, you can even use the, the, the transformers embeddings, the, the pre-trained one, to sort of see how close the question is to the different paragraphs. And then once you have that, you can actually do another sort of run to sort of see where the question is. Um, and, and that, I mean, there is, there's a few different ways you can do that, um, the, the, the ranking. Um, I, I guess like you can use cosine similarity on, you know, these different um, embeddings. Uh, you can do, um, the thing is that there's a lot, there's a lot more complexity that you can get into if you want to. Um, I don't know how much of that is <laughs> like is um, relevant for for the, for this talk, um, but it's definitely uh, something that is the sort of the, the 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 first part of the step of the of the question answering. Where is my? Let me close this one. Um, so here, like for instance, we have the the paragraphs given already in the data set, right? Um, but in in re in real life, a big problem is to find those you know, nice paragraphs that, that, you know, you want to do the question on that you feed in to a question answer modeling like this. Um, and, and that's where the sort of search ranking comes into place. Yes, I will, I will, I will put together some resources and share it with you. I'm, I'm very happy to. Um, um, yes. Um, See where is oh. I think if there's no more questions, then I might leave. Um, or there might there's coming question. I can actually explain some uh, big birds. Oh. Um, I I haven't used it myself, so I I don't know what I would say. I I think the the ones that I'm very impressed by right now um, are the models because I'm more focused on the question answering actually. So um, if we look at the the here, I would say that I'm more interested in these sort of models which are using Albert um, because they're the the problem with with Bert um, is also that it's quite large there's a lot of parameters so running these things take a bit of time um, so if I if I run it here for instance you'll oh, yes yeah, sorry this is the problem when you pre-prepare things I have to restart my kernel today. That's why this nothing was saved. Um, you can see that it takes quite a bit of time to to do the question answering stuff. Um, so, and this is, I mean, this is one that's quite accurate, um, but it's 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 quite large, right? It's it's you know several million, um, three hundred over three hundred million parameters in in this case. So it takes a long time. So what I'm quite impressed with is are these models which are doing really well, like um, Albert or just the well, this what Albert is doing so and so, but um, but they're they're much smaller than like much fewer, um, uh, much much fewer um, parameters than than Bert, um, and the a lot of it is done through pruning and sort of you know dropping off a lot of the the like just reducing the, the neural network uh, size. Um, yeah, I, I I was quite impressed theoretically about the Excel net one uh, as well. Yeah, I don't think I have time to, to go through the other thing that I just wanted to do briefly, but 
um, I would definitely recommend going like checking out the the Transformers package and play around with it. I'll share um, this one and and some other things with everyone as well. Thank you very much for everyone listening. I'm Hobson Lane, co-author of Natural Language Processing in Action. Uh, you can visit the GitHub page, github.com slash NLPIA, if you'd like to download the software. And there's additional information there, as well as the data sets and everything you need to, to do the sorts of things we're going to talk about in this uh, presentation. Uh, also, um, I am the CTO at Tangible AI, where we're actually putting this stuff to work, um, helping nonprofits save the world. You can visit us at tangibleai.com to keep up with what we're, how we're using natural language processing and action for good. So first I'll give you the state of the bots and then I will talk about how to build a smarter one and actually a kinder, better one. And then we'll, we'll give a demo of um, what that bot looks like. So in 2016, I don't know if you took those same surveys that I did, but uh, they were able to pretty accurately gauge your personality and certainly your voting preferences during the 2016 election. And, um, and since then, there's been a very recent uh, leap forward in the uh, accuracy of uh, question answering bots like, um, like BERT, uh, the Transformers model that uh, Google created. This, uh, this model was able to exceed even human level performance on the reading comprehension and question answering tasks uh, that were given it. And that was back in 2019. It's continued to advance even further more recently. So, but these bots in this natural language processing pipeline has been used to, uh, to know your type. And, and for big tech, this typically means your stereotype. So they put you in buckets like your Myers-Briggs or Ocean personality profile so that they can predict your behavior. And in particular, give you advertisements or uh, propaganda to uh, direct your behavior, um, uh, encourage you to vote a particular way or encourage you to purchase a particular products. Um, also, those bots tend to be in walled gardens. They're very tightly integrated with the OS and even uh, the entire business uh, model for many large corporations. Um, you can't really trust them for, uh, for privacy nor accuracy. Um, they have regularly been found to have released your data, either um, unintentionally or used your data for nefarious purposes intentionally. So be wary of bots uh, at uh, big tech, um, as I'm sure you all are. Um, another one that you might, another way you might not be familiar with bots um, interfering with your life and not really helping you be smarter is when you ask them a question such as this one about, say you're on a road trip to, to Vegas with a 13 year old son who has epileptic seizures and, and what to watch for that might trigger those seizures. You're going to get back search results that sell you products. Uh, they're not, you're not going to actually give you the answer to your question, like what those seizures. We'll try to put uh, questions like that into um, our bot, and we'll see if it can do a little bit better at giving you a direct answer to your question. So that brings us to query. The, uh, the bot that knows you, um, you can teach it and you can trust it. You can upload your own documents, your journal, and everything that you um, would not trust big tech with because it is entirely under your control. Query is 100% open source. You can spin it up on your local laptop and it reaches out to resources like Wikipedia or those that you um, connect it to, such as your own hard drive and any documents that you've um, stored there. Uh, how does it do that? Well, um, you simply have to put those documents in a database. You can see the, the arrow at the top bringing in those documents into an Elasticsearch database. That's what we've chosen to, to put it in. But that's um, it can be any document store that allows free full text search on a reasonable amount of time. And then um, you take your input to the bot. Uh, that input comes in as typically as a question, like what triggers seizures? And then um, that will 
search the database of documents, um, either the documents you've put into Elasticsearch. We've also uploaded um, Wikipedia, um, almost all of Wikipedia articles into our Elasticsearch version of Query. Um, but the, the version I'm going to show you here will do that dynamically. It will go out uh, in real time to Wikipedia and grab the articles that it thinks are relative to your questions. And then it will um, provide those documents as what's called context to the BERT question answering model. We fine tuned it to answer questions based on the squad data set on question answers. Those, um, those question answers uh, can then be ranked according to the confidence that BERT has, or in our case, we use Albert, and the, the confidence it has in those answers that it retrieved from those documents. We can also simultaneously send those questions to other personalities or bots. So we have built into query bots like Eliza that can um, can help you with any emotional um, conversation you'd like to have. And um, uh, the, I don't know if this is 1960s technology that can actually help you maintain awareness of your own emotions. And then um, that can all be combined into a conversation planner, which then chooses the response that most uh, closely matches your intent. Some other use cases where if you had a, a bot you could trust that was truly um, looking out for your best interest, you could, um, you could use it for education, uh, even for kids that you might not otherwise trust big tech with. Uh, for instance, uh, my partner at Tangible AI um, helped Oyotu, Oyoti build uh, chatbots to educate children about how to stay safe online and prevent, detect, and uh, avoid cyberbullying and unsafe content. More recently, she's built a, a chatbot for helping women and disadvantaged groups, people in disadvantaged groups, for for um, empower uh, them and, and gain more confidence in their ability to work within the workplace and in school. Um, it helps you deal with uh, things like imposter syndrome and uh, various saboteurs that can uh, encroach on your daily life if you don't pay attention to and aren't educated by this chatbot. And, um, these cognitive distortions that can distort your perspective on yourself and, and the world. So let's get into query, um, the, the more uh, general purpose chatbot that we've built. Um, it uh, can answer questions like, what are the symptoms of COVID-19? We asked this question back in um, February uh, before COVID-19 was really well understood. And yet it was, and it was answering this question with pretty interesting answers. We'll get better answers uh, out of Wikipedia um, that it's, and the reading comprehension sort of exercise that Bert does um, whenever we do the demo shortly. What are the symptoms of coronavirus? Again, not really good um, information available back in February, but as we've improved qu query and um, and uh, improve the, and Wikipedia articles have become more accurate, the, um, the, the answers to those questions have become more accurate. Um, and likewise, if you, you're a mother and you're worried about transmitting the coronavirus to your baby, um, you get this sort of answer back from Query, at least you would have back in February. We'll try all of these again and see how she does uh, with the more recent um, versions of Wikipedia, as well as our, our updated faster version of the of the query uh, algorithm and BERT. So that's it. Let's move on to the demonstration and see how it does in real time here. So let's try by taking, let's ask it the, those easy questions first. So what are the what are the symptoms of coronavirus? We'll capitalize it correctly first, and you'll see that it takes a few seconds. It's going out to Wikipedia or, or checking to make sure that um, it's already retrieved an article uh, for this coronavirus. Then it takes a few seconds also for Bert to read it. But it says that the main symptom of coronavirus is, um, is fever. Let's ask it a different way. The symptoms of uh, COVID. 19. 
See if that comes up with anything any better. Rash and muscle tremors? Maybe, but probably not. Uh, what about what are the symptoms? Symptoms of coronavirus and that's not capitalized at this time. And watch what happens. Um, done this earlier, so I happen to know how this will come out. You can you can answer it, ask it easier questions, and it will do much better. Things like um, uh, so somehow uh, decapitalizing the word made the symptoms mild. <laughs> not sure exactly how that happened. And as you can see, we have uh, have some more work to do on the fine tuning of BERT. It's, it's grabbing some extra characters at the end of many of these queries. Let's try, uh, where was Barack Obama born? This could be a question that might get a lot of false answers if you ask this in the wrong search engine at the right time, or, the, um, uh, or at least back in, um, uh, I guess it was 12 uh, when this was a thing. But uh, but you can see that um, uh, Query is able to find the exact location where the president was born or our former president was born. Uh, when was Barack Obama born? You'll find that um, it can do that one uh, perfectly well as well. So it turns out that there's a lot of questions about when and where inside of Wikipedia. There aren't, I'm sorry, inside of the squad uh, training set of questions and answers. So queries and, and BERT are very good at answering when and where questions. Let's try a who question. Who was um, Jimmy Carter's wife? Uh, th this one will surprise you. Um, uh, unfortunately, it does not do well on who, especially for wife, wife questions. It finds women that are related to the, um, uh, the object of the question. Rosalind turns out to be the name of uh, Jimmy Carter's um, uh, black woman who he hired to raise his children. So in a way, she did act as his wife. He was such, she was certainly the caregiver of his children, but it wasn't obviously his, um, his uh, law, by law wife. Let's try one more question. Let's see, what about, um, what, how, how many are in a baker's dozen? Oh, 13 units. Wow. It didn't say uh, before it, it. I asked it a different way and it said 13 precisely. It, uh, it's really interesting how it can be tripped up a little bit by, um, by how you word the sentence. What about how many neurons in the human brain? Turns out, I think uh, Bert has been trained on a lot of questions about how many um, things like how many inches? Oh, that one didn't work. How many neurons are there in the human, in a human? Let's see if that works out any better. I was answering that earlier before I made some fixes uh, in preparation for this lightning talk. Looks like we're out of time though. So we'll call it a night. Ooh, wow, that was way off this time. Looks like I'm, um, I made some, how many galaxies in the universe? That'll be the last one. Hopefully she'll do a little better before I sign off. We'll ask two trillion. We'll have to check that one on Wikipedia. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to talking to you at the conference. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is 
Jeff Blankenberg. Uh, that's a crazy photo of me right after a, a, a muddy race. Um, but you can find me on all of these places. Um, so feel free to, to join me in any of those conversations. But specifically Twitch, I spend a ton of time talking about Alexa and chatbots and Node.js and AI and natural language and all that kind of stuff on my Twitch channel every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, so if you'd like to join me over there, please do. All right, let's let's get right into it because I really want to talk about <clears throat> what is an Alexa skill and how does this stuff all work? And how do we how do we think about building things for Alexa? Uh, because as we see with some of the other presenters today, like they're building a lot of the natural language understanding engines. They're doing a lot of training on models to make sure that their their bots can respond in an appropriate way. But with Alexa, it's it's a little bit different because we have these devices that are all over the world in people's homes and people just speak to them. Uh, and we are expected to be able to respond back uh, with our own code or whether Alexa is just telling a joke or something like that. So what I would like to do first is kind of talk about what an Alexa skill is, and then we'll get a little into the architecture of how Alexa really works behind the scenes. Where, where are the parts and pieces that we need to care about and how does the, the process from a user speaking get to the point where uh, my code is responding back to a user? So we'll go through all that. And then uh, what I'd like to spend the, the end of the presentation on is talking about voice experiences as a whole. Because I think a lot of us that are software developers, or even those of us that are very deep into AI and NOU, um, sometimes struggle with is thinking about how do we best interact with the user? I almost call the second half of this presentation hacking humans, because what we're trying to do is write language in such a way that humans can effectively respond back to us. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the agenda for the next 50 minutes or so. Uh, so I thought we'd just get right into it and talk about what is an Alexa skill. So I have a, a quick little illustration. You probably recognize at least a couple of these logos, um, but there's well over 100,000 of them at this point, and they do all sorts of things. And so if you didn't realize that these exist, that's okay. Uh, some people do, some people don't. But the idea behind these is much like all the apps that you have on your phone, right? These are all additional things that Alexa can do just by asking for them. So if you want to talk to Twitter or you want to talk to uh, or you want to play Jeopardy or you want the latest news from CNN, right? All of those things are there and they're available and they're, they're really easy to use. You just say, open the thing, right? So, for example, if you needed to get a ride and you wanted to use Uber to do that, you could just say, I'm not going to do this because I'll set your devices and my devices off, but you could say the name and then you could say, uh, tell Uber I need a ride and it'll kick off a conversation with you to say, okay, where do you want to go? Um, what kind of car do you want? That kind of stuff. And it'll, uh, it'll take care of all of that for you. So that is what uh, an Alexa skill is. It can be a number of things. It can be entertainment. It can be utility. It can be information. Uh, lots of ways that these, these things can work. But at the end of the day, they're all considered Alexa skills. So uh, the, that may be strange then to see a picture of a DVD player on your screen, and that's okay. Um, the reason that I like to use a DVD player as a metaphor for how this stuff works is because nearly everyone, unless you're under maybe seven, uh, you've used a DVD player before. And so uh, this is a really good metaphor for how Alexa skills work, and this is something that I like to use as an illustration. So when you think about a DVD player, let's imagine it's completely voice-enabled. Uh, if I wanted to push the play button, I would just say, DVD player, play the movie. Or I might be very specific and command-driven and say, DVD player, play. Uh, the same goes for stop and rewind and fast forward. All of those are commands that I expect the DVD player to execute for me. I don't think any of us reasonably expect that our DVD player can also tell us what our bank balance is or have the capability to order us a pizza. Though I know with some of the, the DVD player software that's out there and certainly with smart TVs, um, there are certainly TVs that can do those things for you. But in general, that's not something you expect when we think about the scope of a DVD player. But in addition to being able to say things like play, we could also say things like DVD player, play Star Wars or play Indiana Jones or um, it's showtime. Right. Those all mean the same thing. They all mean I want you to play the thing that I'm expecting you to play. Maybe it's the disc that's in the drive. Maybe it has a hard drive and we want it to be able to go access some other movie somewhere else. Uh, but at the end of the day, all of those commands really boil down to the play command, which is the button that we see on the front of the device. So knowing that, knowing that those things exist and that that's how the scope of a DVD player works, I want you to use that same model uh, as we think about building things for Alexa skills. So I'm going to jump into an architecture diagram here 
just to briefly touch on what the architecture of Alexa looks like and how we use all of this stuff. So on the very far left side, you can see that I have a person that, with a thought bubble there next to them, and they talk to their device. So if you haven't really taken this apart or thought, given a lot of thought to how these things work, the way that this process happens is the user says the wake word, and there's a, a small bit of software running on the device uh, that's called the wake word engine, and its entire job is just to hear the word it's listening for. It's trained for one word and one word only uh, on your devices, any Alexa devices that you may have. Uh, that is the name that I just said. Uh, it can also be computer or Amazon or Echo. And so uh, they say their wake word and then the device wakes up and it starts recording all the words that the user says afterward. And so if I say something like, what is the weather? Alexa grabs that thing, grabs that recording and ships it off to that big Alexa cloud that's there in the middle. Now, the first thing that it needs to do is speech recognition. It needs to take that waveform, the audio file that we just created with the microphone, and it needs to turn it into something usable by computers, which is text. So we do a really decent job, really, actually a really spectacular job, of turning speech into text. Um, and there's a whole science behind that, but it's not anything that most of us that are software developers building things for Alexa need to worry about. It turns that speech into text, and then it uses machine learning to pattern match uh, against all the training that it has available to it from all the other things anyone's ever said to Alexa. And then we apply natural language understanding, which uh, all of us have built into ourselves as well. The way I like to explain natural language understanding to people that may not have heard about it before, I know this is an audience that really does understand a lot of these things. But when I like to explain natural language understanding to my sister or my dad or somebody like that, um, the way I explain it is we all have natural language understanding baked into all of us as humans. We don't have a good way to capture that sometimes, and we've never really given it much thought. Um, but you've all been in a relationship at some point in your life where someone said to you, I'm fine. And your natural language understanding engine was able to recognize that they are, in fact, not fine. Um, so that gives us the ability to really look at the language and do a deeper understanding of just the words that are presented to us, right? We can take into consideration things like, sentiment and a number of other aspects to say, I think this is actually what they're going for. And this applies to a number of things, but imagine someone saying to you out on the street, hey, what's it like? Um, and if you say, what's it like? Most of us know you're asking what the weather is, but there's no, there's no clues directly tied into the sentence the user said that give you any indication of what they're really looking for. It's only because of the colloquial meaning of what's it like that you even have any idea what, uh, what, you, what they're asking for, which is the weather. And the reason that that's interesting, the reason that that's useful is because between machine learning and natural language understanding, it allows us to pair all of this down to what I was describing with the DVD player, which is what are the things that our skill can do that the user might ask for? And so weather is not a great example in that case because Alexa on her own can handle weather requests. We don't need a, an extra skill to do something like that, although there are some fantastic weather skills out there. But if I'm building a skill that does something else, maybe it's a trivia game, and the user says, give me a science question. Well, I have, I have an intent, like a button on the front of my DVD player, that is um, the question intent. And when the user asks me for a question, I use that intent to recognize, oh, they're asking me to do whatever it happens to be inside of my code. And so once we've applied the speech recognition, machine learning, and natural language understanding, Alexa uses all the training data that I've provided to recognize that the user wants to talk to my skill and wants this specific intent. And so that intent um, is then communicated to my skill as part of what we call a request. And that request document is just a large JSON document that tells me an anonymized version of who the user is, uh, any date time information, what intent they wanted. Uh, and then we can also fill in things that we call slots, which are the individual variables that may uh, occur inside an intent. So an example, uh, one might say, what is the weather? Or um, give me a question. But if they say, give me a sports question, I need to know that they want sports. So it's not just that I want the question intent. Now I also want to provide the, the service with the ability to pull just a sports question. So those slots also apply in the things that we're thinking about and as the language translates out to our code. And we finally made the journey from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, and we're at our service. So we've received this document that gives us this information about what the user's doing, what kind of device they have, um, 
and what they said, what kind of uh, intent that they wanted to indicate to us. And we use that information based on our APIs, our data, our logic, our context, everything we know about a user. We take all of that, boil it together and say, oh, well, they want a, a trivia question. Um, this would be much easier to just say, hey, here's the question that you want back, right? So we, we use everything we know about that situation to then provide back to the user the question that they re requested in the first place. So when we do that, we send a response back. One of the ways that we do that is through text to speech. So when Alexa is speaking back to you, um, what she's really doing is taking the speech that the user, I'm sorry, the text that the user provided and passing that back through the device to you. Uh, but there's also other ways that this happens. You can see that I have a number of devices behind me here that a lot of them have screens on them. Uh, those screen devices can communicate visually, so we can uh, add all sorts of visual appeal to our screens, including buttons and um, imagery that, or video that makes sense for the specific context. Um, so we can provide visual feedback uh, through the screens. We also have within the Alexa app itself, we have something we call cards. And that's another way that you can kind of persist information for a user. So going back to the weather example, if they ask what the weather is, they don't have to ask for the weather again if they want to be reminded. Uh, they ask for the weather once, they get sent a card inside their app. And then they have that as a reference to be able to say like, oh yeah, the weather at three o'clock today is going to be this. I don't have to ask Alexa for the information again. So that's kind of the, the full loop, the full cycle of how these things are structured. Uh, ultimately, we build a series of intents. Those intents are translated by the Alexa engine, uh, the Alexa cloud to be able to identify when a user is trying to do something inside of our skill. Uh, and then we build a response based on that request and pass that back to the user. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about how this stuff actually works. And I, I like to use this slide, okay, let's do this, because we need to actually go do something. So I'm gonna jump out of the slides here for a second, and we're gonna go look at actually building something. Uh, so I thought it might be easier to illustrate this stuff if I just do it myself. You can see I have a number of skills that I've built myself. I have 69 pages of skills. I don't think I realized the list was that long. Um, but I'm building right now, I'm building a skill for myself. Uh, as somebody that gets out and talks a lot, I thought it would be kind of cool to build a skill that's all done in my voice um, and allows people to communicate with me and send messages and things like that. I've built a Star Wars database. I've built a, I'm working on a casino that works across all kinds of text and voice interactions. So it could be running on Discord or Slack or certainly um, on something like Twitch or Alexa. So uh, let's go ahead and create a skill. You can see that I have this button here. And to get here, you just go to developer.amazon.com slash Alexa, and you can click through from there if you'd prefer. But um, I'm going to create a skill. So I'm going to start here. And I'm doing this all here in our developer portal, uh, which is obviously very web-based. Uh, I could do all of this from the command line. Um, and we offer a really robust SDK for not only uh, Node for JavaScript, uh, but also for Python and for Java. Uh, there's also a, a large number of third-party SDKs for things like C Sharp and Ruby. So it doesn't really matter what language you want. Um, you can find tools and technologies to use. Um, but our three core, fun uh, core languages that we support are JavaScript, Python, and Java. Okay, so I need to build some kind of new skill. I don't know what I'm going to build yet, but we'll, we'll call it Manning for now uh, as a way to give it a name. And I want to explain a couple of the things that are in here just so you're aware of, of what's going on. So as I choose a model to build for my skill, this is already starting to talk about what does this look like? What is the, the, in, the interaction model that I'm going to use with my users? What does it look like? And how, how do we want our users to best interact with our skill? So custom is what you're going to choose 99% of the time. Um, that is where you do most of the things. It's all the things that won't fall into the buckets that I'm about to show you. But uh, I'll explain the others very briefly. Uh, a flash briefing, this is something that a user can use on any of their devices. Uh, they subscribe to a number of sources that are flash briefings. And when they say, Alexa, what's it? I don't want to actually do the thing. But if they say, uh, start my daily briefing or what's in the news today, it starts their daily briefing and it just goes source by source through the audio content that those sources have provided. So you can imagine ESPN headlines and CNN headlines, maybe a, a podcast service that you're subscribed to, maybe a weather flash briefing that will just give you the weather. So as you're standing there and you're taking your shower, brushing your teeth, doing whatever, you could be listening to all of this stuff, catching up and getting your day started. So that's what a flash briefing is. There isn't a model per se that a user can interact with your skill. It's more just to give the ability to users to de decide what they want to include in that overall flash briefing that they listen to. 
Smart home skills are a very refined set of intents. Uh, we talked about those earlier with the DVD player, but for smart home, you have things like on and off and setting temperatures high and low. I have all these crazy lights behind me. And with many of those lights, um, they all have smart home interactions so that you can say things like turn them on or turn them off. Actually, I'll, uh, I'll show you that here in just a second. My machine has decided to time out, so I lost my, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I lost my other laptop. But if I say something like Alexa, turn off office, what we should see is that everything goes away, right? Except for the like studio lights that I have here in the camera and the streaming that I'm doing. But uh, if I want to turn that stuff on, because all of these things are smart home devices, I can very easily say, Alexa, start the office nonsense. And the reason that I've referred to it as that is because that's what my wife refers to this as. Uh, the fact that I have all of these crazy lights and things all hanging around me here, uh, especially in my backdrop, is, uh, is certainly nonsense. But being able to control all of those things uh, is done through smart home interactions. So then we have music skills and video skills. These are basically skills that allow you to control a collection of music or video. Uh, so they have very predefined intents like play and pause and rewind and next and things like that. Uh, and then we have meetings and education. And these are obviously meant for very specific verticals where they have specific needs around like booking meeting rooms or, or looking at coursework and education. Um, but again, very, very specific defined models that work across all skills uh, versus custom, which is what we're working on now. Uh, and custom allows us to pretty much do whatever we want. So if you're, if you're building something that falls into one of these categories, I highly recommend picking them because it does, takes a lot of the work out of the way for you. But if it's too limiting, you should probably look at custom. The other thing that's really cool about this is that with a lot of uh, technology anymore, you have to set up a server and you have to get all these things up and running. And one of the cool things that's um, been really useful uh, in the last year and a half is that we provided what we call Alexa hosted skills. And what this allows you to do is write your code and have Alexa hosted for you for free. So you can go ahead and build an entire Alexa skill, the front end, the back end, all of it, uh, and not even have the risk of cost. Uh, even if your skill was to blow up in popularity, um, you, once you hit some limits, we will ask you to move your skill to uh, to your own hosting. But as you initially start and as you get building uh, and with some pretty high free tier limits, you can build a skill completely free without having to worry about a, a bill surprising you one month because you got really popular. So I'm going to choose Alexa hosted as my option here. You can do this again. All of this stuff can be done from the command line. Uh, but I think it's a nice, easy visual way to see a lot of this stuff. So I'll go ahead and create my skill. The next thing it wants to know is what template do I want to use? Now, the Hello World skill is the one I'm going to use, but you can see that there's a number of other options here that give you a bunch of sample code and interaction models that you can use uh, to build on top of it, even if you'd like. So we have things like a fax skill. This is just something you ask it and it gives you facts back. Um, we have uh, simple games. We have a, a fruit shop skill, which thinks a lot about like how would grocery shopping work in a multimodal way with screens and other things like that. Um, so there's a number of them, and a lot of times these are good examples to start with when you want to learn that technology. So you can see what it includes. A lot of them include uh, what we call APL, which is our Alexa presentation language. That's the, the markup language we use to put things on the screens of devices. Uh, but for Hello World, very, very simple, very basic, uh, and I'll use that as my starting template because that's what I use most of the time when I start anyway. So I will choose that. It's going to take just about a minute, as it says, to load this entire thing together. And uh, what, I'm, what it's really doing is provisioning an Alexa skill for me. Um, it's setting everything up. It's defining an uh, invocation name, which we'll get into in just a minute. It's defining all those intents and saving all of that stuff for me. And then it's also spinning up an AWS Lambda instance for me, which is a serverless uh, technology. And it allows me to take uh, the code, the sample code for the Hello World skill, and it's going to host it for me in that Alexa hosted environment. Uh, now, what's really nice about this is they've tied it all together here in the dev portal so that you don't have to go anywhere else. Uh, you don't have like when I build skills, uh, I, gen I tend to sit and work locally. So I have everything here locally on my machine in like VS Code or something like that. Um, but if you would prefer, you could do it all from the browser. You don't need to have any tools uh, to develop locally if you don't want to. Uh, we use a technology called Cloud9, which is another AWS service that allows you to basically have a hosted um, development environment right in your browser. And I'll, I'll, you'll get to see that here in just a second as well. So the first thing that I want to show you is this is kind of where we load up our skill when it's here the first time. But if I look at invocation, um, this is the first one. We, we've defined it as change me. I need this to be something else. So I'm going to call it Manning. Um, we'll call it Manning uh, Live. 
Um, and so that is the name of my invocation. That's my invocation name for my skill. Now, what I'm really doing there is defining the term that users will use to interact with my skill versus the, the native Alexa experience. So they would have to say something like, open Alexa, oh, I'm sorry, open Manning Live or um, start Manning Live or a number of other things, which I'll talk about later in this presentation. But the idea is, is that they have to indicate that they want to use this the first time that they want to talk with it. Once they've said that, once they've said open Manning Live, once I've done that, then every other interaction is within the scope of that specific skill. So it allows me to then continue the conversation without having to say the name over and over again. But it's the same way that when you look at an app uh, on your phone, you you open the app with your finger and then every the entire scope of what you're doing lives within right there. And if you choose to leave that app, that's fine. No, no, no harm, no foul. Um, but you can always come back to it again by just tapping on its icon and, and getting back into it. So that's my invocation name. I have uh, I have gone ahead. I thought I built, but maybe I didn't. Um, but so uh, I'm building my model again. I'm rebuilding it so that it recognizes my new invocation name. And the next thing I want to look at is my interaction model, which is right here. So I have five predefined intents. Uh, four of them are here natively. And the fifth one is here because um, you have to have at least one other one. So in this case, you can see I have a cancel intent, a help intent, a stop intent, and a navigate home intent. These are four built-in intents that every skill has to support. In the same way that you think about anything that you've ever used on almost any platform, um, there are required interactions that you have to have. For example, if you build an app on a mobile device, uh, right, you have to be able to support things like uh, closing the app and, and uh, you use a lot of the same Chrome uh, and buttons and things within each of the applications. Uh, when you think about building for the web, um, or certainly building for a desktop operating system, uh, you have to use the, the Chrome that's a around so that people can actually close the app the way they expect to uh, and minimize and maximize and things like that. So uh, those kinds of things, the, this is our Chrome. Uh, you can say cancel, you can say help, you can say stop, uh, and you can say navigate home in the case that you're building something that involves a lot of screens. So those four are there by default and you do have to support them. Uh, we'll talk more about how you use these effectively, but it should be contextually aware. So if someone says help, it shouldn't just be like, hey, this is a cool skill that does a thing. It should be, oh, I see you were trying to do this here. Let me let me tell you more about that. Um, so that's one good example of how this stuff works. But the hello world intent is where I start building my own custom stuff. Because the other four, the ones that start with Amazon, those are gonna be in every skill. Uh, but we wanna think about what our skill is gonna do. So for this hello world intent, I'm not gonna use this, but I'll dive into it to show you what it looks like. You can see that I have trained it, well, the, the sample code that I'm using has trained it. And it says, if the user says any of these things, and not just these things, but I want you to imagine a situation in which there is a generalized set of training data for this intent. So, hello, how are you? Say hi, world, say hi, say hello. That is training data to tell Alexa that if anyone says something like this, something that fits within this collection of data, then we should hit this intent. It doesn't mean they have to say these things exactly, just as long as we're within uh, a margin of error that suggests that this, uh, uh, this eighth term should be part of this collection. Uh, and we can add as many of these as we'd like. I think there's a limit at 50,000, but honestly, if you're up over a thousand, you probably are doing something wrong. Um, but so we can say, what's up, right? Uh, add that as another, another term to this. So this becomes training data. Again, we build in and change that model when we hit save and build. That's what tells Alexa that, hey, I want, I want to incorporate these new terms uh, or this new training data into making this stuff work. Uh, but I have these intents and then I also want to do something interesting with like some data. So you guys may notice I have a couple of toys behind me here. Um, I've become a bit of a collector uh, with, excuse me, between me and my children. Uh, we, uh, we have too many of them. Uh, I think there's probably, there's easily over 300 in this house someplace. Most of them are in this room. Um, but it's, it's a lot. So why don't we do one that's like, uh, 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 these are called Funko Pops. Why don't we come into my intents? We'll add another intent that is the Funko intent. And I'm going to create this new custom intent. You can see that there's a bunch of built-in types for things like show times and music and video and weather. Standard kind of intents that I don't really need to build a lot of the training for. Those are defined models. Uh, but I want to if I want to use a book intent in my skill, 
there's already a lot of built-in stuff and it has all the training data and all the titles and all the authors. So I don't necessarily need to do a lot of the work, but for this one, we don't really have that luxury. So I'll create my custom intent. And then it says, what would a user say to invoke this intent? Well, uh, they might say, um, show me the, the good one. Uh, that's Neo from the matrix there. Show me the Neo. Right, so that might be something they'd say, or they might say, let's find another guy. Um, this is uh, Rick Vaughn from the movie Major League. So we could say, uh, let me see the Ricky Vaughn. Right, and so I have these two intents. You could imagine I'd create a long list like this, but the first thing that should sit uneasy with you is that I certainly wouldn't want to create one of these for every one of the figures that's in my collection. I would want to change this up to be uh, something that is easily plug and play. And so that's the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new slot uh, and I'm gonna call it um, character. I don't even know that that's an appropriate representation, but we'll call it character for now. And I can now say, let me see the character figure, or I could say this one here, I could just choose character again. And now it's both of those. And you can see that I have this slot that I've defined, but I don't have a slot type. We have a lot of very cool built-in slot types that define a set of collection of data the same way that we're defining these utterances. It's a bunch of training data, but I don't have one for pop figures. Uh, so what I might do instead is come down to my slot types and add a new slot type that is called character. And in here, I'm going to have values for this. So I might have Neo or Kool-Aid Man. I know he's over my shoulder. Uh, there's somewhere we have um, Ricky Vaughn. Uh, let's get a couple more in there. We have Baby Yoda. Should know what's over my shoulder, but I don't. Uh, there's a Chester Cheetah. So you can see we can start adding a bunch of the the kinds of data that we expect people to say. Uh, and this this list could be hundreds and hundreds long if it makes sense, but that's the kind of data that we would expect the user to say in that situation. So if I save this and I come back to my intent that I was building, right? We built this Funko intent. I can now define uh, my slot with a specific slot type that is that list of characters that I just created. Now, what's cool about this is I'm gonna go ahead and save and I'm gonna build uh, my model, is that I instantly, as soon as this build happens, I get the ability to test and take apart exactly how this, uh, this stuff works. So if I look at the evaluate model tool that's up here, um, I have a couple of questions coming in while I'm waiting for this build to finish, so I'll answer them. Can I go over the intense part again really quick? I totally can, uh, APATS. I'll do that in one second. And then Dawning Truth asks, can you pull data from the API for your slots? And the answer is yes. Um, and can you self-host C-sharp apps? Absolutely. I mean, C-sharp will work on Lambda. Um, you could set up a Lambda function and those free tier limits still exist. You just don't have to set it up. Uh, but yes, you can self-host your, you can host these things anywhere. It doesn't have to be on Lambda. I just find that for the, the cost and convenience, it would be very hard to compete with putting it somewhere else. But if you already have a server that you're paying for and you're not going to see any incremental cost for putting something on your own server or on Azure or whatever, no, you can absolutely host these wherever you'd like. And in fact, um, while I'm waiting for this, you can see that right here, for endpoint, it's pointing to a Lambda function for me right here. Uh, but there's nothing stopping you from scrolling down a little further and choosing an HTTP endpoint. Uh, and that was tough to say. HTTPS endpoint um, that is on your own web service that does it your own way. So um, this is uh, the ability. If I change this, I have to make sure I have an SSL certificate. There's a number of other things that I need to make sure that I have. But there's nothing that says you can't do this. You are more than welcome if you'd like to set up your own HTTPS endpoint. Okay, so that's there. I have my stuff built. So I wanna show you this evaluate model just to give you an example of how this works. So if I were to say, um, show me the Kool-Aid man figure. You can see what it's showing me here um, are the considered intents uh, that it had happened as, as I made that request. So I said, show me the Kool-Aid man figure. And it said, oh, you know what? This person is almost certainly asking for the Funko intent. And I think that the character they indicated is the Kool-Aid man. This is the data that gets passed to my skill, the intent they want and any slot values that I might receive. But I can take this a step further. 
I can also look at NLU evaluation and create an entire set of um, tests, basically. And this is actually something that I recommend for people to build before you start. One of the things you do when you think about building voice experiences or chatbots the same way is that you generally know what your users are going to say to you. So I recommend building some evaluation tests first before you've ever written a line of code, before you've ever created an intent, and then go about building out your intents to try to serve those purposes. The same way that if, if you're a software developer and you're supposed to write some code, you will find it's much easier to write a set of unit tests that represent what your application should do first and then write the code to make those tests pass. Um, but oftentimes we don't, uh, we don't build in that way. We build the opposite way. We build write a bunch of code and then we hope that we've achieved all the business objectives, which can sometimes be kind of a mess. So if I, if I think about this test batch, we'll call this Manning just to be consistent. Um, the first thing that I want to do is enter an utterance. So I want to say, um, show me the, let's come up with a character that is not in the list. The um, Pop-Tarts speaker, right? So that's an example. If you see here, uh, he's up here, the little Pop-Tarts figure. I could also say, let me see the Twinkies. I'm pretty limited in the model that I've created, right? There's not a lot of competition for these kinds of statements. So these should work kind of the way I expect them to, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So for this one, I want, I'm, I'm telling it what I expect the outcome to be. And so for the Funko intent, I'm gonna say, well, I definitely expect that both of these are gonna hit the Funko intent. This is my list of intents. For the slots though, I, I want this one. Uh, I want my slot name to be character. I think that's what I call my, my slot name. And then in here, I want the value to be one of these things, but not one of those actual slot values. So I'm going to say, I expect it to be Twinkies. And I'm going to change this one to be um, character. And I'm going to tell it that I expect this to be Pop-Tarts. Now, it doesn't actually know anything about the Funko catalog. It only knows what I've been able to tell it. Um, APATS is asking what the difference between an intent and a slot is. An intent is uh, one of the things that at a high level your skill can do. So uh, it might be able to say, um, like I have a Funko intent, right? Anytime I ask, anyone asks me about a, a Funko figurine, we hit the Funko intent. But the slot itself is the individual figure that you indicated. So in a statement like, um, ask this skill uh, to show me the Twinkies guy. Well, that recognizes that, hey, that statement looks a lot like a Funko intent, so we're going to pass them to the Funko intent, but I want to let that intent know that they want the Twinkies guy, right? And that's kind of what I'm referring to here is that um, I'm expecting that this is going to be maybe Twinkies, maybe Twinkies guy. I don't know what's going to come out of this. We'll have to, we'll have to see. So I'm going to save this set, and we'll actually just run these as tests and see what we have right now. So if I come back to evaluate model, and now you can see I have this annotation source. I'm just going to run those two tests. And what it's going to do is run those statements against the model that I've created of intents. Uh, and it's going to tell me if it matches the expected outcomes that I defined. And if it doesn't, then I've got something broken. This is a really useful test for yourself. As you continue to add more intents to your skill, you'll find that you may get some gravity for one or for the other. And all of a sudden, a few of your utterances are failing because you've added a bunch of other intents uh, with utterances that are very, very similar. And so it, it can't differentiate the two. They're, they're too similar. So let's see how I failed here. I was expecting that I might. Um, yeah, so for this one, you can see that Pop-Tarts came through perfectly. So even though Pop-Tarts isn't even in my slot value, it was able to recognize that, hey, that's the that looks a lot like a value that I would expect from these other things that he gave me. And in this case, I wasn't sure how this would work. If it would give me Twinkies or Twinkies guy, um, but it gave me Twinkies as a value. And so it was able to pass those things through. Um, what I should do is fix my test here. It's the test that's broken, not my skill, but it's passing through the data that I would expect to receive when a user says something like, let me see the Twinkies guy, right? Which is a totally human thing to say. Uh, and we don't want to change the way that users interact with our skills. We want them to be able to use this stuff and understand it. Okay, that was a lot, um, but that's, that's kind of the core of building a skill. And then when you get to the other side, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't know what I wouldn't have saved, so we're just going to carry on. That's fine. 
Uh, over here in code, you can see this is that Cloud9 that I was mentioning earlier. This is a development environment right here in my browser. And you can see that I have this Hello World intent handler. This is the code that we give you. This is using our Alexa Skills Kit SDK. And what it's doing is saying, okay, was the kind of request a launch request? If it is, then I want to say something like this. Was the request instead something like a Hello World intent? Um, if it's a hello world intent, then cool. We want to say hello world. And so each of these kind of chunks, uh, like this right here, is a structure that allows us to indicate to our user what the response should be. We recognize what their request was, and then we pass it back as a response. And the way we do this is pretty simple. Uh, we have this handler input response builder. This is where we build our response using the SDK. And then we provide a speak value. The speak value is what Alexa will say immediately. So regardless of what the user says, whatever we put into this speak output, that's what's going to be said back to the user. Often we'd have a lot more logic to determine what that should be. But in this simple example, we're just going to say welcome. You can say hello or help. The second value you see here, uh, the second function is called reprompt. Now, reprompt is kind of an interesting concept to understand how it works in, in, in a user's head. But I want you to imagine for a moment that you walk up to a stranger on the street and you say, hey, did you, do you know if it's going to rain today? More than likely, they're going to stare at you oddly, like, why are you talking to me, right? That's kind of the, the initial thing I would expect from someone to say, to, to do with me. But then they'll say, yeah, I think it's going to rain, or um, I have an umbrella, duh, right? Like, they'll, say, they'll respond to you in some way in a relatively quick uh, amount of time. But if you walk up to someone and you say, hey, do you think it's going to rain outside? And they just stare at you, and they don't say anything, you might give it one more effort. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if you understood me. Uh, I just I was wondering if it's going to rain. I was going to stop and get an umbrella if, if you think it might rain today. Uh, if they respond at that point, great. What ends up happening, the way this is structured with Alexa, is the reprompt is that second question. So in this case, I'm providing the same value, that same speak output. Um, but I could provide anything that I'd like. And I can, my reprompt can just be a reminder that, like, hey, I didn't hear you the first time. Uh, what kind of pizza did you want? Or um, what figure were you looking for? Or whatever it is. Uh, with, with the reprompt, though, if you don't provide a reprompt at all, Alexa won't open the microphone. So uh, in a fact skill, it makes a lot of sense. Hey, give me a space fact. You can stack all the planets uh, in, a, in the solar system between Earth and the moon. That's a science. That's a space fact, right? But there's no follow-up. There's no additional information. There's no conversation happening there. I just asked it for a fact, and it gave me a fact, and we're done. But for most voice experiences, most chatbots, most everything, you want to be able to put the user in a situation where they're continuing to have a conversation, and there's a back and forth. This reprompt provides that. It opens the microphone after you've said your first thing, whatever you provided in speak. Uh, but it also provides a thing to say when we don't hear the user say anything. But if we reprompt them and we say, for the second time, uh, what's the weather? Do you think it's going to rain today? Um, and they don't respond again, Alexa closes the microphone in the same way that if you're on the street, you would just walk away and go find someone else to talk to. Sorry, I didn't find a device named microphone. Alexa, stop. So um, that's kind of the structure there. So Dawning Truth uh, asked another question, which is, how do you get an understanding of the types of words a, a user is likely to use? Well, the best way to do this, honestly, is to talk to other humans, um, which as a software developer, sometimes I recognize my industry has a hard time doing talking to other people. But the key when you're building an experience like this, some kind of voice experience where we're thinking about what a user might say, the best way to do this is to poll humans. Say, hey, I'm going to give you a, 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 po a postcard or a note card with something written on it. And what I want you to do is try to accomplish that task with me and let them use their own words. So they're going to say things like, uh, what's my bank balance? Or um, how much money do I have? Right? Those are all different things that mean the same thing. And so by testing it on humans, you can get a really good representative sample of what you think people will say, but never ever rely only on your own knowledge. Because the way you speak uh, even though your brain tells you that's how everyone speaks, it's not. Uh, and you limit yourself greatly by uh, only considering what you think someone might say. So the more you can talk with people, family, friends, colleagues, uh, whoever it might be, um, I would really be interested to give you an opportunity to talk to those people and see how much information you can get from them about how they say it, the words they use, the, the tonation they use, all of that kind of stuff really matters. 
So that's that's how I generally start. Um, but for things like the list of, of characters, right, for my slot values, that's pretty easy to identify. I could go find a list someplace of all of these figures, uh, dump them all into my slot and say, okay, well, that's, that's enough for now. Um, it's realistic that if a new toy comes out, a new figure was released, it probably would still land because of the, the wrappers, the utterances that I'm putting around those, uh, which if, if we go back to those, look a lot like, come on, um, things like this. Let me see the figure. Show me the pop, right? It doesn't even really matter that there's a slot value in there. I should be able to still handle this. And if they don't provide me a character, I could pop up and say, oh, which character do you want to see? Because uh, maybe I mis misunderstood them or maybe they didn't provide one at all. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways to, to manage and, and control that kind of interaction. Um, but at the end of the day, what you're providing here in your intents is a set of speech patterns that humans use. And then you just plug that character thing in wherever it makes sense within the sentence. Um, so that's kind of the structure of all of this. Now, I know I have... Um, I probably have about 20 minutes left, 15, 20 minutes. So what I'd like to do is really, I've spent a lot more time on this than I thought I would. Uh, and I can keep asking questions if you guys prefer, but I do have uh, what I'm calling 10 things every voice app should do. So I'll answer one more question from Dawn uh, and then I'll, I'll jump into uh, this really, really fast because I think there's some good lessons in here. How do you monetize your skill? What options does Amazon provide? We, we provide two options. It's really four options. Um, the first option is what we call Amazon Pay. You would use this if you're selling any kinds of physical goods or services. Uh, you may have heard of Amazon Pay in other places. You may have even paid for things with Amazon Pay before, uh, but it works a lot like a credit card. So if you sell a service or a physical product that costs $100 um, by using Amazon Pay, just like using any credit card, you probably pay about 3% or so uh, in fees to cover the cost of that transaction. So you would receive about $97. The other option is what we call in-skill purchasing. And with in-skill purchasing, um, what you really get is the ability to offer subscriptions, one-time purchases, and what we call consumables, uh, or what everybody calls consumables. And those three things are pretty obvious. You know what a subscription is, right? It's a monthly recurring uh, fee. It can also be yearly if you'd prefer. Uh, one-time purchases are things that people may buy and then they just own forever. So imagine uh, my trivia game that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's 20 different categories and they want to buy the sports category. Well, for $2, you can buy that one category or for $4 a month, you can have access to all 20 categories with my subscription, right? Those are ways that you could monetize. Um, the last one, of course, is consumables and that's for things like coins and hints and stuff that people might use up inside their skill. Uh, and this is actually really nice. It's all built in to, to use whatever the user's default credit card is on their Amazon account already. They can make the entire transaction with their voice. Um, and what's really cool about this is that you can upsell them and offer products at the time that it makes sense. It's not just a full shopping experience. Uh, but the, the catch with this is it works a lot more like you would, you would find things sold inside uh, a mobile app. So there's a 70-30 split on the revenue from those, those sales uh, where you keep 70%, but Amazon keeps 30% to manage all the transactions and all of the, the infrastructure for that. In the same, it's the same numbers that uh, Google uses, that Apple uses, that everybody, uh, it's kind of an industry standard split. So that is, um, that is the two ways that you can uh, earn money uh, in, a, um, in, a, in a predictable way, I guess. Um, there's also a slightly less predictable way, something we call uh, Alexa Developer Rewards. And if you build a skill that is highly engaging uh, and it is popular with our users, uh, Amazon actually has a bucket of money every month that they hand out to developers that have built very, very cool skills. And so if you search Alexa Developer Rewards, you'll find all sorts of information about it. Um, but it is uh, it is something that uh, can change month to month, and it's not something that I would necessarily build a business on. But if you've built something that's cool and compelling and engaging, um, it's something to make certainly make it worth your while. Uh, there's one guy, uh, his name is Nick Schwab. He's built all sorts of amazing skills for Alexa. Um, and he bought um, over a series of months, he, he earned enough money to buy himself a Tesla. So it's not a small amount of money, but it's also uh, very challenging to justify building a business on because if um, a bunch of other amazing engaging skills show up, your revenue could be cut at any time or split or whatever. So something to think about, but um, hopefully that's uh, kind of helpful. Um, all right, I wanna make sure that I'm answering any of the other questions that are here. I'm, I'm going to skip through this very, very fast, and then I can I can stay around in the chat 
uh, on Discord afterward. So the, the first thing that I recommend for voice skills is that you do, do one thing really well. I'm going to go a lot faster than this slide deck permits. Um, so to do one thing really well, an example of this is a skill I built called Games Back. Uh, I'm a big Cleveland Indians fan, and every morning I go to ESPN or something, and I look this chart up. And I want to see where everybody is and what the standings are and whatever. And in this specific instance, I really care about this column only. I don't really care whether or not they won or lost. What I care about is what position are they in and how many games back from first place are they? So I built a skill that just looks at that data and just provides that kind of response. So when you ask the skill, what are the Indians doing? Oh, they're six and a half games back from first place uh, behind the Twins or whatever it might be. So number two is to make your name memorable. You noticed earlier we looked at our invocation name. Um, you want it to be memorable. And I have a really good example of this uh, with the magic door. They, they monetize and uh, promote their skill as the magic, open the magic door. It's a really easy thing to remember as you're trying to come back to your device and, and uh, try to engage with it the second time. But naming is really, really important when we think about skills. And here's a bunch of ways I mentioned earlier that you can launch skills. Ask, begin, launch, load, open, play, resume. Um, those are all good examples of how a skill can be open. But having a name that's meaningful is really tough. I have, uh, we'll try this once just, uh, just to have a little fun. Alexa, open three clues. Welcome to three clues. In this game, I will give you three clues and you need to figure out what those clues have in common. Are you ready for your first three clues? Yes. A river, a pickup truck, a hospital. A river, a pickup truck, a hospital. They all have beds. No, I heard you say pets. Ah. You can try another guess. Should have talked toward the Or say I give up to hear the answer. They all have beds. Correct. Hmm. They all have beds. Would you like to hear another three clues? Sorry to see you go. Catch you next time on Three Clues. Okay, so that's an example of a simple skill that does um, a, a simple game, right? I, I present you with three scenarios and you need to tell me what they have in common. Um, I really toyed with what the name of this skill should be, right? Should it be something like Triforce from like Zelda, something like that? Like I was trying to play on the word try and then I thought about the fact that the word trivia really has the word try in it, although I don't know that that's the root word is really uh, based on three at all. And then um, I thought about flipping it around, right? We could call it something like via try, like by way of three. That was kind of a clever name. But the thing I realized really quickly is that no one's going to remember a name like via try, even if I really, really want them to. Uh, what they're going to remember is that I said the word three clues like 90 times while they used the skill. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to just call the skill three clues because at the end of the day, that's the thing that they're going to remember. What was that game that gave me the three clues? How does that work? Um, so just something to consider as you go into this. Uh, another thing I like to recommend is focusing on intent and not commands. Uh, it's very, very easy to get wrapped up in thinking about things like this. Ask dev tips about monetization or tell me about persistence. Um, this is a skill that's meant to help Alexa developers answer questions. Um, the trick with this is that there's a built-in assumption to the things that we're building here that a user knows what to ask for. And a lot of times they don't. They want to learn something new or they want to get some new information, but they don't always know what to say or how to say it. And these things really assume that you as a user, know exactly what's going on. Uh, so if we think about intent, we think about what the user really intends to do. They want to learn something new, or they want to hear a speech con, or they want to learn something next. Um, in those cases, let them say stuff like this, and then direct them to the place that they want to go. Now, you can still support the examples I showed a moment ago, but these kinds of things make a big difference in thinking about what are users really going to say. Because you can't just deliver your API and hope that they're going to figure it out. Um, they don't know what your product list is. They don't know how to say the specific things that you're expecting them to do. They're going to be more vague than you would probably anticipate. Okay, running, going so fast. Uh, let's talk about simplifying choices. This is another fun one for me. So imagine you're having a conversation and someone asks a question. Um, this is where you don't necessarily know what you need to say, right? How am I supposed to respond to this question? This is especially hard when it's open-ended. Is there something else I can help you with? Do you have another question? Would you like to know something else? The challenge with these kinds of questions right here 
is that they're not actually open-ended questions. We're hoping that they are. But these are all yes, no questions. Look, look at them again. Is there something else I can help you with? Do you have another question? So we're really asking yes, no questions to the user, but we don't really care about yes or no, because if they say yes, what are we gonna do? We're gonna say something like, okay, what else would you like to know about? What can I help you with? And so you're better off starting with questions just like this, rather than asking for their permission with a yes, no question. Just get right into the meat of what you're really expecting them to give you, and you'll save them a lot of time and a lot of frustration because they don't wanna have to constantly say, Yes, I'd like to do that thing. They just want to go do the next thing. So something else to consider. Uh, this is fun for all of you that are in the audience. Um, uh, this is a, a fun exercise that I'd like you to participate in. Normally, I would do this in front of a live audience, and I'd ask people to raise their hands, but I can't see you, so I'll trust that you're doing it. Um, but I'm going to present you with a choice. And when I present you with that choice, you have to choose that thing forever. You're never allowed for the rest of your life to change your mind. And I don't think you'll have a hard time with this, but I just want you for a moment, maybe you're sitting in your office, have some fun with this. The, I'm going to put two things on the screen. The moment you know which one you would choose for the rest of your life, just put your hand in the air and I'll give you about five seconds. I don't think it'll take you much longer than that. So here we go. Here's your choice. Everybody knows instantly, right? Uh, everybody always knows that they either like vanilla or they're wrong. That's, that's just how the decision goes. But in this case, you were able to very quickly say, no, I would always choose this one for the rest of my life. Now I want to do it again. I want you to think about what is the thing that you would choose if you had to choose forever. Come on, pick. It's much harder, right? Uh, this becomes a much, much harder process when we have to think about all the possible values that are out there and all the choices we can make. And Well, I, I see chocolate chip. I really like chocolate chip ice cream, but I haven't even read the rest of the list yet. And he's making me make a decision right now, and I don't know, right? There's, there's frustration. There's anxiety. There's all these things that start to pile on top of you as you think about making a choice like this. Did anybody pick Swamp, by the way? Uh, I think that's a weird name for an ice cream. But uh, this is what it is. Turns out it's actually sounds like it's pretty delicious. Uh, anyway. So let's think about having a fruit stand or something that happens inside of a skill, right? One of the things that we could do is give them a question like this. We have apples, bananas, oranges, lemons, grapes, kiwis, blackberries, strawberries, and mangoes. Which fruit do you want? The problem with this kind of questioning is that the user heard a list of things not knowing that they were going to have to pick one. They didn't listen as closely as you hoped. They never do. We need to simplify choices. We need to think about hacking the human. Think about how do we get this information into their head in a way that they can use it effectively without having to say what? Or I'm sorry, can you say that again? Uh, so flip it a little bit. Let's limit our choices a little bit and say, which fruit do you want? Apples, bananas, or oranges? Now, the user always has the freedom to say, do you have anything else or something else? Or um, they could just say grapes. All of that's fine. It'll all still work. But by front loading it with the question, which fruit do you want? apples, bananas, or oranges, you've cued them that, by the way, I'm asking you a question right now. Please pay attention to what the possible answers are. Just that little flip makes a huge, huge difference in thinking about how to interact with your users and how you want them to be able to understand what's going on. You don't want that stress and that anxiety hanging over you about what choice am I going to make and how, like, how is this going to work? You guys experience this every time you call your bank or your insurance company and you get into one of those telephone uh, operating systems. Press one to do this. Press two to do this. Um, well, I think it's two, but I don't know. So I'm going to listen to three and then I'm going to listen to four. <sighs> no, none of those are it. Which one did I want? And I don't know if you guys know this. There's a secret way that you can kind of hack those systems so that you, um, you can get back to the beginning. All you have to do is hang up and call back and they'll give you the same choices again. It's awesome. Um, so that is... Uh, that is one of those things that we really need to think about as we go into this, is how do we make sure that we're giving our users a good um, experience every time that they go through all this? So number five, we're going really fast. Use the one breath test. I tried to find some pictures of one breath. Uh, this seems like a good picture of one breath. This certainly illustrates one breath. I thought this one, uh, I guess I cut it out. I had one picture of a guy doing a, a breathalyzer test. That was supposed to be here too. So uh, use the one breath test. Uh, everybody knows who this guy is. Uh, I built a Star Wars skill that has all the information about the entire Star Wars universe. Um, and when I was writing it, the answers looked like this. Luke Skywalker is a Tatooine farm boy who rose from home. Like it's this whole long diatribe about what's going on with Luke Skywalker. And the challenge with something like this is that um, a user stops listening. 
it needs to be short and concise. And maybe you give them the option to be like, this is who Luke was in one sentence. And then uh, do you want to know more? I have lots more information if you want to hear the long version. Uh, but don't force this upon them. Uh, what I like to do instead for my Darth Vader example, I have one and it just says Darth Vader is a bad, bad, bad man. That's it. That's the whole definition. It's fun. And it's interesting. And then if you want to dive in to get more information, you can find out all about his history and uh, his wife and who his children are. I'm not going to give any spoilers, but um, he has children. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about um, thinking about that one breath test. How do we make sure that we're only saying as much as a user would be able to say in one breath? Because more than that, it, it's, it's just too much cognitive load uh, for a user to handle. Okay, include a variety of responses. I like to mix things up quite a bit, but if we think about any other software we've ever built, we're told not to do this, right? Uh, this is the um, Apple style guide. This is the Google style guide. Consistent, responsive, predictable. These are all things that we hear over and over and over when we think about building software. And um, I don't wanna do that. I wanna be completely the opposite of that for voice because if it's predictable and consistent, it's also boring. And users that are bored don't listen. So what I like to do is write seven, five to seven versions of everything that you're gonna say inside your skill. I do this all in a database. Uh, I think I have an example here. These are all my goodbye messages um, that my skill uses when a user exits the skill. And it just picks one randomly every time. But I do this for every bit of speech across the entire experience. So every time Alexa is gonna say something to a user, I have seven ways she could say that. They're all just slight variations on each other. But by doing that, it, it forces the user to pay attention because it's not the words they've heard before. It's not doing things maybe even in the same order that they've seen before. So lots of stuff to consider there. Uh, you can also vary the order you present them. Like if you were a travel agent, we could ask the questions in this order, but we could also ask them in this order. There's no reason to keep them consistent. Uh, and by presenting them in a different order, you don't lull them to sleep. You don't get them to a point where they are just mentally filling out a form. They have to pay attention, they have to stay engaged, and uh, you're really going to be very interested in what's going on as a user when you don't know what's coming. Number seven, handle the unexpected gracefully. Uh, this is very easy to do when someone says something that you weren't expecting. Uh, this is the standard error that Alexa provides. Um, but you can first, you can mix that up and make it more fun. Like, hey, something broke, but like, we, we're on it. We're sorry. Here's some stuff you can try that we are pretty confident does work. Uh, but on top of that, what if I, in my baseball skill, what if someone asked for the New York Jets? Well, I should be able to handle that, even though I don't know anything about the New York Jets. I should be able to say, uh, they're not a baseball team. Is there a different team I can tell you about? So instead of just giving them an error, like, wah, wah, I don't know what to do, you say, hey, what you asked me for is not something I know how to do. Why don't I redirect you over here so you can check out the stuff that I can provide, right? Redirect them to the, the content you're expecting them to use. All right, number eight, really fast. Make enhancements based on data. There's lots and lots of analytics you can look at to see exactly what's going on inside your skill. Uh, these are my top intents. If I was building this skill and I was working on uh, something like the display template intent, which is down near the bottom, it has number six next to it. Um, and somebody said, hey, we should invest a lot more time in that. I might look at this and say, yeah, but it seems like people really care about the news. Maybe we should spend more time giving them a better news experience. Um, this kind of data should really drive any future development you do. And I'm sure most of you know that, but that's just something to, to keep in mind that it exists and it's available. Uh, number nine, provide contextual help. I mentioned this earlier. Um, when people say help, this is a very common experience they get in voice and chatbots. Here's what you can do, right? I, I have pizza and breadsticks and pasta. What do you want to do now? Well, that didn't actually provide me with any help. Um, that's just, it's like an about page on a website. You need to help the user, let them figure it out. So you could say, hey, you're trying to order a pizza. You can add or remove toppings by saying stuff like this. You could add sauces or cheese or whatever. Just let us know. So do you want to get back to your pizza or do you want help with something else, right? And we've posed a question that takes them on one of two paths. <clears throat> Give the user an opportunity to say, I can, right? I, I can do these things. I can make this stuff happen. Uh, it's very easy for them to turn off their their voice device or their chat bot or whatever it happens to be uh, and just open their phone. And we want to make, we want to serve as a utility. We want this to be easier than their phone. And in many cases it can be. Okay. Last one. And I mentioned this earlier to um, the questions that were being posed by Dawning Truth, but beta test with real users. Um, I, I, there's a beta testing module built right into the Alexa console. So you can add a bunch of email addresses and send out beta invites to people so that they can use your skill before it's released. Um, but what I recommend is talk to your, your, um, stock photo family, like let them know what's going on and how it works and how they should try it. Um, this is my team. We were trying out of all, all of our skills one day and we were just seeing how things worked. Uh, but the illustration I like to use the most, and this is what I'll wrap up on, 
is that it's a lot like the Wizard of Oz. There's two lessons from the Wizard of Oz that you should take away when you think about building voice experiences. The first one is uh, the Ruby Slippers. She uses three clicks to get back home. Um, there's lots and lots of things in our lives that are very easy to do. If I can open my phone and in one or two taps, I can solve my problem. It's very unlikely that I'm going to commonly do that with my voice because it's just too easy. But if you find things that are three clicks or more away, like Dorothy did, um, you'll find very quickly that those are the things that serve a ton of utility for your user because they've got to dig through menus and find stuff and, and navigate. Um, and so uh, that is something that I would highly, highly recommend. I just called, got called out for a spoiler. Uh, if you haven't seen The Wizard of Oz, man, uh, it's been out for a little while. The other thing that I'm talking about with beta testing, though, is the, the wizard himself. He stands behind a curtain and lets people talk to this big floating head that's in the room. He is in, in many ways doing exactly what I recommended earlier about beta testing. Let people come up and talk to a blank curtain about what, what it is they want to try to accomplish. And this is a big, big part of that, is give them an opportunity to talk the way they want to talk and then build your skill to accommodate those things. Okay, so that was the 10 things. This is a quick list. Uh, I don't know if you guys take screenshots or whatever, but this is a good thing to remember what those lessons were. And with that, I will say thank you so much for having me. So with that, I'll sign off. Uh, thank you, everybody.